Good afternoon, colleagues and friends, and good morning, colleagues and friends from America. I'm really happy to open this important event on e-consumes and the climate actions that is inside the program All for Climate Italy 2021, the satellite event of the Pre-COP26. This is the pre-conference of the parties on climate change that is held in Milan before the COP26 in Glasgow. The event is organized by Italian Ecomzims Network inside the celebration program of 15 years of Ecomzeology and the University of Milano Bicocca, the Caterham Ecomuseum from UK, and the Association Brasiliera de Ecomuseu e Museu Comunitarios, and the DROP International Platform for, for Ecomuseums and Community Museums. It is also part of the satellite events of the World Forum of Democracy promoted by European Council on the issue Can Democracy Save the Environment? This event is also linked to the resolution Museums, Communities and Sustainability that ICOM approved in the General Conference of Kyoto that also underlined the role of community museums in the achieving the United Nations 2030 Sustainable Development Goals, in particular the climate adjusting. The event, as Raul already said, is in streaming and it is recorded. Well, why we decided to organize this event? The climate crisis is the defining challenge of our time and we should try to tackle it all together. Most people and institutions are worried about the climate crisis, but stay silent and continue to be inactive. It is necessary to create a culture for action on climate, inviting people and institutions to take part in the debate about climate action and building a community around this topic. With this event, we want to focus our attention on eco-museums and community museums and to discuss how such institutions could bring people together to learn about the solution and join the fight for a better world, providing pathways into civic engagement. Some museums around the world are already promoting educational programs on this topic and in New York City, there is also a climate action museums but what we wanted to discuss today is the role of eco museums and community museums. The conference is organized in three sections. In the first session, local authorities and Professor Peter Davis will give a brief message about the topic. The second session will show eco museums practices for climate action, and the speaker will present eco-museums and the community museums practices and projects in achieving the sustainable development goals. The third session, in the third session, experts will talk about the community-based museum's role for climate action. In the conclusion, sorry, um, in the conclusion, uh, Harry McGill gives us a stimuli for the future, for a better future. At the end of the conference, there will be time for questions that can be asked preferably uh, through the chat of the Zoom platform or via the Facebook page of the Italian Ecomuseums Network in the comments area. So I, I think that we can start uh, with the first session, but Raul, you say that you prefer to launch some videos before yes, the yes, video yes. of Alberto. Yes, please. Uh, let's start the video. It's a video from Poland, the Museum of Poland.
Okay, in one sec, we can go on. Okay. We can now launch the video from Alberto Garlandini, the president of ICOM International for his institutional greetings. Unfortunately, Alberto can stay with us uh, this afternoon, but I would like to say um, a super thank you to Alberto for your precious support to eco museums and the community museums around the world. So I think that we can launch the video, the institutional greetings videos from uh, Alberto. Here it is. Dear friends and colleagues, it is a great pleasure to be here with you today. Today's forum, a satellite event of the pre-COP26 on climate change, will discuss a strategic theme, the agenda 2030 and climate action, the role of eco museums and community museums. Since 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic has jeopardized the lives of millions of people around the world. I wish to take this opportunity to commend once more the work of all museum professionals who have guaranteed their public service and mission under the most exceptional circumstances. The pandemic is still a priority. Nonetheless, the devastating effects of the climate crisis continue to impact our natural and cultural heritage at a global level. The dramatic biodiversity loss and the climate crisis show us how tight relations between man, biosphere and geosphere are. The cultures of the world, the cultures of the Anthropocene are suffering because landscape, natural sources and livability are endangered. Indigenous communities are at the forefront of the climate crisis. Not only are their livelihoods under threat, also their cultural heritage cannot survive without their natural habitats. Even native languages are in constant decline as a result of the climate crisis. Fighting the climate crisis and the loss of biodiversity is an imperative of our times. Museums, eco-museums, and all cultural institutions are essential to ensure a sustainable future. They play a key role not only in fostering knowledge, awareness, and behavior changes, but also in sustaining mitigation strategies. Museums and eco-museums are in a unique position to support environmental policies, disseminate scientific information, and sustainable practices in the local communities. In September 2019, the International Council of Museums General Assembly in Kyoto, Japan, passed the resolution on sustainability and the implementation of Agenda 2030, transforming our world. The 2030 Agenda has become the fundamental reference for ICOM's work over the next decade and beyond. On Earth Day 2021, ICOM joined the Global Coalition United for Biodiversity. Let me now heartily thank the ICOM's Working Group on Sustainability that supports our organization in implementing the Kyoto Resolution. I am glad to see that today some members of our working group like Michaela Rota and Harry McGee will give their contribution to the debate. ICOM sustains museums all over the world so that they integrate the attainment of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals 
and the fight against the climate crisis in their mission and vision. ICOM supports all the initiatives promoting awareness about the climate crisis, as well as sustainable behavior, responsibility, and civic participation in all communities. The first G20 culture ministers meeting was held in Rome at the event of July 2021. It focused on the importance of culture and cultural institutions for the sustainable world. ICOM was one of the two non-governmental organizations invited to the summit. We were an active partner throughout the preparatory work. I am proud to say that the museum's voice was heard throughout the meeting. All the events were held in museums. An Italian museum director, an ICOM member, made one of the opening speeches at the Colosseum, and I presented a keynote speech on addressing the climate crisis through culture. In the final declaration, the G20 countries recognized ICOM as an important actor of international cultural action and highlighted the indispensable role of museums in heritage protection, sustainable development, and education. Dear friends and colleagues, global challenges call for global responses. International cooperation is needed now more than ever. It's time that together we take bold steps to ensure that culture and museums fulfill their role in addressing climate change and contributing to climate action. ICOM fully supports your proposal to create an Eco Museums and Community Museums coalition after the COP26. ICOM calls museums and eco museums to face the challenge and lead the change. Now is the time for new responsibilities, the time for unity and cooperation. As uh, ICOM founding fathers stated in 1946, only together will we be able to move forward. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Alberto, for your contribution and above all for inviting us to remember that is time museums fulfill their role in addressing climate change and, climate, and contributing to climate action. Now I can give the floor to Professor Peter Davis, Emeritus Professor in Museology at the University of Newcastle upon Tyne. He is my great friend and he introduced, me, introduced me to the world of eco museums. Please, Peter. Thank you, Nancy, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here with you all in this virtual Milan. Um, the aim of this meeting, as we've, as we've heard, is about sharing information about how eco museums and community museums can contribute to the debate about the climate crisis. We'll consider what actions we can take with our communities to protect our cultural, natural and intangible cultural heritage. Those features that make our places special and give us a sense of belonging. We'll hear from an international array of speakers about their work, their hopes and plans for the future. How are their eco museums and community museums acting as catalysts for change? renewable and sustainable development? Can they effectively contribute to the sustainable development goals and climate action? These are big questions for small museums. I've been very fortunate to visit Milan on several occasions and one of my abiding memories is seeing Leonardo's Last Supper in the convent of Santa Maria. And thinking about Milan and Leonardo prompted me to reread Walter Isaacson's biography of the artist. 
where I was reminded of Leonardo's fascination with and reflections on apocalypse. It was a vision that he frequently returned to. And in the Codex Arundel, we can read this, this, this description written by him. What he wrote was, the rivers will be deprived of their waters. The earth will no longer put forth their greenery. The fields will no more be decked with waving corn. All the animals finding no fresh grass for pasture will die. In this way, the fertile and fruitful earth will be forced to end with the element of fire. And then its surface will have burnt to a cinder and this will be the end of all earthly nature. This wasn't a prophecy. It was simply Leonardo's fertile imagination, his vision of what an apocalypse could be. But he isn't very far from describing many of the events that we are now witnessing. This year, huge forest fires have become commonplace with disastrous effects on nature and communities. Just one example in California, the largest and most ancient trees in the world, some more than two and a half thousand years old, are under threat as the Sequoia National Park faces a huge fire risk. Many ancient and giant trees have already been lost. The Sequoia National Park is currently closed. Other tragic environmental events, severe flooding, landslides, desertification, acidification have impacted on communities, many of them in remote rural areas. The climate crisis, the loss of cultural assets and the biodiversity crisis are intertwined. Returning to Leonardo, a key feature of his life was his love of the little town of Vinci. It was his place and, returned, and he returned there frequently. You can only imagine how he would feel about the potential impact of climate crisis on the town, on its people, its landscape, its economy and its traditions. Place and belonging, the intersection of communities, culture, traditions, history, landscape and nature, are central to eco-museums and community museums and have been since the inception of the eco-museum idea some 50 years ago. As individuals and communities, we treasure these places. We are proud of them. So how against the odds can we possibly build for the future? We're not searching for a utopia, but simply somewhere decent for us all to live, a place where there is an appreciation of the old ways in modern times. Can rural landscapes and communities around the world with their age old rhythms of work, weather and wild things survive? And can we leave a legacy for the future? So returning to the question I posed earlier, what practical roles can museums, eco museums and community museums play? And what are their strengths? Uh, as uh, Alberto has already mentioned, the museum world is, of course, greatly engaged in these debates. And we've heard about uh, the G20 culture ministers meeting on climate change and culture where ICOM took a major role. Uh, Alberto drew very close attention in that meeting to the close connection between climate change and the damage to natural and cultural heritage. And he stressed how, e how museums being trusted institutions can play a major role in raising awareness and engaging local communities to support climate action. Alberto also mentioned Kyoto 2019 and resolution number one on sustainability and the implementation of agenda 2030, which really was a clarion call, I think, for museums worldwide, worldwide to react to the climate crisis. Perhaps for this meeting, even more significant was resolution number five, museums, communities, and sustainability. This resolution demanded ICOM do greater recognition of and support for community museums and eco-museums. This, this resolution stresses the contribution that they make to safeguarding, understanding, and promoting access to natural, cultural, and intangible heritages. 
what is it about eco museums and community museums that, that make them especially pertinent to these debates? Let me take you back to two slogans that emerged as environmental concerns grew in the 1960s, namely think global, act local, and small is beautiful. Think Global, Act Local, although appropriated by the environmental movement, was actually coined as early as 1915 by the Scottish conservationist Patrick Geddes. But it's just as pertinent today, and especially so for community museums and eco-museums. As community-based organisations, we are aware of the big picture, but our focus is on our place, our locality, our heritage. Individually, museums can react to local needs and take small steps to a better future. If all eco-museums and community museums act together, we can make a real difference. Small is Beautiful was also adopted by the environmental movement. It was the title of Schumacher's book, Small is Beautiful, a study of economics as if people mattered. He suggested we use appropriate technologies, actions and policies as an alternative to the mainstream idea of bigger is better. Eco-museums and community museums in the main are small organizations rooted in their communities, so fit perfectly into this small ethos. We can be alert, nimble, and take opportunities. Yudha Varin suggested that eco-museums should be audacious, imaginative, and find new ways of working. And we can do this because we know our place and we're not subject to specific rules or conventions and our communities can make the big decisions. To conclude then, why are eco-museums and community museums important to debates about climate change, biodiversity loss, changes to landscapes and livescapes and sustainability? The following are the reasons why I feel they're important. They are locally focused. They are welcoming to all. They're connected and help each other and learn from one another. They inspire wonder and increase awareness of the heritage of specific localities. They grow knowledge within and beyond the community about heritage. And they encourage participation with and by the community. They are strong environmental catalysts encouraging local people to act for the natural and cultural environment. They can equip people to monitor environmental change and make conservation efforts to protect the heritage we care about. They support other heritage organization conservation efforts to sustain culture and nature, and they can review their own carbon footprint and environmental impacts. I'm sure many of these features will become apparent as we move now to hear the experiences of our speakers in the next session, Eco Museum Practices for Climate Action. So thank you very much for listening and I pass you over now to Nancia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, for your interesting contribution and above all for helping us in understanding better what eco museums are and above all what they could be. And I also hope that your speech can become a chapter for the book that we are going to, to publish. Thank you, Peter. Okay, my pleasure. Okay. We can now start the second session about eco museums practices for climate action, coordinated by Edo Brichetti, who is a member of the Italian Eco Museums Network. So I'll hand the floor over to Edo. Okay, welcome to everyone from all over the world. This is a fantastic day where important people will give their contribution about the best practice. In Milano, there are and there are, there are two places, there is taking place an important international meeting with the young people from all over the world. The president Mattarella and the prime minister uh, Draghi just uh, joined the young people and they assured that it's time to act soon. So I am acting soon and I'll pass uh, the stage to Claire Cooper, 
Um, Claire works across the fields of regeneration culture, tourism, and public health. In addition, he is co-founder and co-director of the Catherine Eco Museum. So it's an honor to give her a stage. I only ask you, please, because you see I've got a clock just in front of me, to, you've got eight minutes because of this session is very, very, very crowded and we want to give a, a room to all the others. Claire, it's up to you. Thank you. Thank you. And it's a great honor for me to be part of this event and to have the opportunity to share with you how the Cataran Eco Museum in Scotland is mobilizing heritage for climate action. Our Eco Museum, which is only the second in Scotland, is set across a thousand square kilometres of rural eastern Perthshire and western Angus in Tayside, in the middle of Scotland, if you look at that map in the right hand corner. Launched in November 2019, just before the pandemic, we aim to tell the story of this part of Tayside across 6,000 years of human history and 400 million years of geological history. And like many parts of Scotland, we have a treasure trove of natural and cultural heritage to draw on. Huge prehistoric megaliths and Pictish symbol stones, unknown stories from the great legends of King Arthur and the pan-Gallic hero Finn McCool. Contemporary histories of the Scottish traveller community, important events linked to the great Jacobite rebellions, fables of the Catarans themselves, the Highland clan warriors who came to be associated with cattle raiding in the 17th and 18th centuries. You can discover the history of Scotland's Berry capital, Blair Gowrie, and visit the site of its 12 Victorian textile mills. You can walk a part of the Highland Boundary Fault in Ayleth and enjoy its well-preserved Old Town Centre. A hike along the Cataran Trail, one of Scotland's great long-distance footpaths, offers you spectacular views through huge landscapes sculpted by glaciation and traversed by old drove roads and ancient rites of way. Aimed at attracting both local people and visitors, we've put together 24 pre-designed itineraries connecting folk to 134 points of natural and cultural heritage interest. And we've only just started to scratch the surface of what we could share. Funding permitting, we also have a regular program of events and activities that aim to interpret this heritage in unusual and surprising ways. Now, at the same time that we launched our Echo Museum in 2019, we started to think about the second stage of our development. And despite the pandemic scuppering our plans in 2020, in January this year, we launched a three-year program dedicated to climate action under the rather unusual title of the Museum of Rapid Transition. The inspiration for this framing came from Andrew Sims of the Rapid Transition Alliance and a very powerful provocation he wrote in 2019, which emphasized the huge currently underutilized potential that our heritage has to help people build more regenerative and resilient lifestyles and mobilize climate action. Not only are they a knowledge and learning resource which can help contextualize what is happening, they are a participative force which can bring people together, challenge the status quo, and create spaces both physically and in our minds to imagine that anything is possible. And as our Museum of Rapid Transition program ideas have come together, it has become evident to us that the place-based community-led ethos of Echo Museums creates uniquely powerful opportunities to help people respond to the cascading crises we face, to tell a new story of place. Our new Museum of Rapid Transition story begins this year with a focus on landscapes, with projects and activities that reveal how changes in geology and climate have shaped our landscapes, determined the flora and fauna, influenced human settlement, land use, and social and political organization, and demonstrate both how our past actions have degraded these landscapes and how by reconnecting to ancient knowledge, we can regenerate and innovate our relationship with it. We're using the environmental discipline of paleoecology and the public engagement mechanism of citizen science to tell a new story about one of the Echo Museum's principal rivers, showing how investigation of past environments can be used to restore ecosystems now and in the future. We've designed hands-on learning experiences in heritage-based knowledge and skills that reintroduce people to ideas that might help them take regenerative action in their everyday lives today. 
We've created a new story bank of films which illuminate how past communities from all cultures across the world understood their interdependence with trees and passed on that knowledge through stories, myths and legends. And these are being used by local climate and sustainability groups as conversation starters in the run up to COP26 and to promote another itinerary that we're developing that will guide people to trees chosen by local people for their personal importance. Also in time for COP26, we're creating a 50 metre long, two metre high timeline of 20,000 years of climate change in this part of Scotland, which will be exhibited outside in one of the Echo Museum's main towns. Its message is simple. Will we use the lessons from the past to shape a more regenerative future? Connected to this exhibition is an artist in residence who is working with townsfolk on the creation of another piece of public art that makes manifest that regenerative future. In fact, working with the best of our local contemporary artists is an important part of our ethos. Their imagination, that uniquely human capacity to envision that which is not, to heighten our senses, interpret our deepest feelings and create meaning in so many ways is something all of us have experienced. And the role of contemporary artists in reinterpreting our heritage needs, in my view, to be much more highly valued and utilised. We need both reason and re-enchantment to help us navigate the future. And an example, oh, this is really stuck. Oh, there we go. Uh, an example of our equal focus on re-enchantment is the creation of a giant 1,500 square meter hand on one of the hillsides in the northern part of the Echo Museum. Made out of jute and geotextile and fixed to the hillside with steel pins, it is inspired by the Glen's strong links with the legendary pan-Gallic giant hero Finn McCool. And on the first day of COP26, we plan to wake him up with the Carnix, the ancient Pictish warhorn, which will be sounded three times as one of the old stories about Finn tells us that he is asleep under the mountains with his warriors, ready to be woken by the signal in order to come to our aid. And finally, having significantly grown the number of walking and cycling experiences that can be enjoyed by visitors, we've begun to promote the Echo Museum as one of Scotland's best car-free holiday destinations, all part of the regenerative tourism frame that we're now using to communicate all our visitor-facing work. Next year, funding permitting, we will foreground the role of imagination in our past. Widely regarded as one of humanity's most powerful attributes, we will illustrate how imagination was used to build community resilience and rehearse radical change. And in 2023, we will draw our species remarkable capacity for design in response to continuous change and the creation of new knowledge, exemplifying how by reconnecting to the ingenuity and innovation of our design history, we might draw inspiration from it to catalyze the design innovations we need now to make that leap to a more livable world. So aligning our work against the 2030 SDGs, we identify especially with these on this slide, but we're also very guided by our own Scottish Government National Performance Network, which of course has many crossovers with the SDGs. So that is a very tiny snapshot of how our Echo Museum, the Cataran Echo Museum, is mobilising heritage for climate action. And I think now that I'm going to pass on to Raoul. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful, Claire. And the land, your landscape is like the Scottish song, Amazing Grace. Fantastic. And now I'm passing uh, the stage to, first of all, my friend, Raul Del Santo, who is a very important person. He is uh, the, an ecologist, the coordinator of the Eco Museum of Parabiago, Mulini Natural Park. And he is also uh, the manager of a platform for Eco Museums and Community Museums, which is the web platform Drops. So Raul, it's up to you. Well, Claire, eight minutes. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much and good evening. Uh, I would like to talk about Italian eco museums and the climate action, and in particular what happened in the Parabiago Eco Museum that uh, I manage. Here uh, it is uh, my eco museum, the city, the river, 
and so on. We are near Milan in the north part of Italy. Even here in Parabiago, there are climate sentinels like this rare butterfly and natural disaster more and more frequent and intense. Sentinels and disasters show that the climate is changing. Young people also here in Parabiago ask for action. This is what happened. First, we defined a long-term strategy, then goals to achieve, and finally, evaluation of impact. The strategy of uh, Italian Eco Museum is linking global and local sustainability. In uh, 2019, Italian Eco Museums modified their strategic manifesto and underlined that Italian Eco Museums are committed to caring for heritage. The manifesto also stresses the role of Eco Museum for development of communities the achievement of the 2030 United Nations goals, in particular, the climate action. These are the goals we want to achieve. They are interdependent goals and represent the largest and most global effort to affect change capable of setting humanity and the biosphere on a path towards a sustainable future. We consider it impacts inside and outside the Eco Museum. In this building, there are the Eco Museum's office and other offices of the municipality of Parabiago. We worked on energy efficiency, thermal, for example, thermal insulation of building, lighting, the, redu um, the reduction of carbon emission uh, through energy production and uh, waste minimization. But the core business of the Parabiago Eco Museum and uh, many other Eco Museums in Italy is outside the office, working not only for, but uh, also with the community. To, pr to produce uh, outside impacts, we are going on the stairs of participation, up and up to the people empowerment. That is make people able to carry out projects for the common interest and with an holistic vision. For example, we empowered many local stakeholders to activate the circular economy of the Parabiago bread. This is the, the diagram of the circular economy of the bread of Parabiago. I just talk about the points related to climate action. 170 hectares of agricultural fields are cultivated with the conservative agriculture. This agriculture impacts in a minimum manner on the ground. It reduces CO2 emissions, preserves biodiversity and the humus. The fields are fertilized by the compost produced in a local farm from vegetation vegetable waste coming from the public and the private gardens of Paraviago. Uh, what's happening? Uh, it is stopped. I don't know why. No, no. Oh, okay. The bread was the first of many products made in Parabiago. The Eco Museum empowered people to leave agribusiness and start agroecology. Agroecology produced both good food and agroecosystem service. For example, landscape, oxygen production, climate regulation, and so on. 
we carry out uh, education activities and uh, promote the forestation inside the Forest Me project aimed at planting a tree, three million of trees by 2030 in the metropolitan city. The butterfly, the butterfly reminds me also an important action that the museum can do. They can help people understand who they are and be aware of their cultural heritage. According to Dante, men are like warm due to their imperfection, but they are desti destined to become a butterfly as long as they are not di diverted by their pride and sense of omnipotence. Eco Museum can tell people that uh, the flapping of a butterfly's wings can cause a hurricane on the other side of the world. This is the butterfly effect. Everything is related, everything is connected, and small action can help to generate big changes. Thank you very much. Well done, well done. Um, you just put the accent on outside action of EQ museums, and this is very important because we also, uh, we always say museum is important, but a museum which uh, goes outside is more active, is more powerful. Now I pass the stage to, I don't know the pronunciation, eh? Gershom Rosentino de Almeida, who is the director of the Eco Museo, La Grande Eco Museum, he is a doctor in history and associate professor at the University of Estado do Rio de Janeiro. I'm, I beg your pardon for my pronunciation, uh, Gelson. It's up to you. Oh, thank you, Edu. Uh, I am. Uh, sure. I see, you, you, you see? See, yes, we see, we see. Oh. Thank you for your presentation, Edu. Uh, I'm honored to represent the Brazilian Association of Eco Museums and Community Museums, ABRANC, whose mission is to promote the creation, development, support, and dissemination of eco museums, community museums, and similar processes. The ABRANC considers the sustainable development goals to be fundamental in their project and action. We must understand that this institution occupy a privileged place of these actions due to their proximity to the community. Ilha Grande is the fate of... Uh... Sure. Ilha Grande in this state of Rio de Janeiro uh, is a have, uh, has a total area uh, 193 square kilometers. Uh, with exuberant fauna and flora, native of the Atlantic forest, a rich marine life and high geomorphological diversity, farms, quarantine, hospital, and prisons, was an uh, island prison in the past, and traditional community. All these factors contributed to, for UNESCO to recognize Ilha Grande as part for the first Brazilian site to be considered by the same time cultural and biodiversity heritage a world heritage of humanity. Eco Museu Ilha Grande is both an Eco Museu and a University Museu, which integrates the University of State, uh, University of the Rio de Janeiro. The Eco Museu Ilha Grande have four units: Museu do Cárcere, Prison Museum, Museu do Meio Ambiente, Environment Museum, Centro Multimedia, Multimedia Center, and Botanical Park, Parque Botânico. The mission of the Eco Museu La Grande is to incorporate the community as the subject of the process of conservation and sustainable development of the territory of Ilha Grande through the preservation, research, and the appreciation of history, as well to promoting its memory, culture, and identity. The Eco Museu La Grande is a museum that, with the basis firmly established in the past, invite everyone to see the present in the sustainable way and to participate in the construction of the better and fairer future in a environmental and social terms. A powerful instrument used by 
the ECOMS Euler grant for the Ashton in the project is to enable the de development of the goals. All goals are reference for us. The ECOMS Euler recycle project of the concerning a select and dis dis disorganized grow of Euler grant. The problem is especially accentuated in the summer with the escalation of terrorism. Several structural problems are aggravated, especially to the accumulation of solid waste transported and discarded on the continent. The Ecomus okay. Recycle Project has offered the community of Illegrand Council handcraft production techniques with contribute to the elimination of carbon in the environment. This project eliminates pet waste in Villa do Gis and has served as a model of the other communities. With the summer purpose, the Botanical Park is building a wall of pet bottles. Around 8,000 pet bottles will be reused. This project is expected to help reduce the solid waste, train residents for the development for this type of construction with less environment impact, represent a new opportunity to generate employment and income, and at the same time, promote environmental education and conservation of the environment. In this way, we meet goal 15. Based on goal 11, we develop activities for the reuse of pet, tetra pack, and paper, conducting workshops, encouraging discussion, and environment awareness at the importance of preserving the ecosystem and with it the well being of future population. We have established important partnerships with groups, companies, and cities that work with the reuse of recyclables, enhancing the removal of that waste. With more go for, we have promoted course lectures, conservation circles, conversation circles, and various projects for the communities with quality science information in accessible language and also encouraging young people to engage in science. Based on goal at 40, we carry out the project Marine Biodiversity of Ilha Grande Bay, Marine Biology, a way to tell the stories of the sea and monitor more. Marine monitoring of the Ilha Grande Bay. For goal five, we have the Girls and Women Science Project. From the Eco Museu Ilha Grande and Community Based Tourism Project, we meet goal one, encouraging local initiatives to develop products and use the whole materials to generate income in local development, valuing history and culture of local communities. The Ilha Grande and Community Health Project is linked to goal three. Its purpose to is to promote prevent health care actions in isolated communities and immigrant contribute to improving the quality of life of communities with an emphasis on women. The project Museum of Prison, Culture and Freedom, linking to Goal 16, aims to register, preserve, and enhance the, prim, the prison memory of the community of Villa do Gis. We promote reflections of human rights with the exposition and the stair of rights. The Ilha Grande, the Ecomus Ilha Grande proposed to be an, an interlocutor between different social actors, such as the universe, city hall, state organization, tourism, business sector, neighbor association, and non-governmental organization. It takes the willingness to listen, meet, and learn through experience, as well as share. Brazil, Brazil, Bolsonaro's government be, has suffered the strength the, of the effects caused due, due, due to the country's bad management, its wide. wide. It goes from the return of, return of hunger, inflation, unemployment, and poverty to the pre preventable death of 600,000 Brazilians due to COVID and the president's lack of urgency and is assuring the population access to vaccine. When it comes to environmental protection, sadly, the re reality is just as tragic. Increase in deforestation, the, pardon, uh, sorry, increase in the deforestation and fires that have a grown significantly in the last three years, mainly in the Amazon. We need to address environment protection as inseparable part of the national development process. More than ever, 
effective global climate commitments and actions are needed to reverse the damage caused by climate change. Human degradation goes hand in hand with environmental degradation. The forms of production and exploitation of men and natural resources by the capitalism need to be revised. However, in the meantime, we at Eco Museu Ilha Grande, as well as other Eco Museums and community museums, can and must do our work together with the communities through local action and articulation with the other force can contribute to a transformative action as even bigger. It may not be enough, but we can give up on doing the best we can. We can give up on the planet. We can give up on life. Together, we are stronger. Thanks. That's it. That's it. A great thank you to you. A great thank you to you. Oh, my pleasure. And I think that Brazil is one of the most wounded countries in the world. I'm thinking of a deforestation of tropical forest. So I, I was very impressed by, by the woman and for your, by your project Recycle. When, I, when you wrote, uh, the woman said, it gives me a sense of living. I think this is very important. Well, now... Grazie mille. Uh, pardon, I'm just uh, turning the page to my Karen Brown. You, remem you, rem you remember me when we met uh, in Milano, Karen, Karen Brown. Karen Brown is a senior lecturer in art, history, and museum and gallery studies at the University of St. Andrews. I love St. Andrews very, very much. And, uh, but she does a lot of things. For example, she operates with the ULAC museums in Chile, Costa Rica, France, Peru, Portugal, Scotland, Spain. My dear friend, but you travel the much, you travel a lot. Now I am leaving the, the stage to you, Karen. Thank you so much, Ido. Um, and yes, I, of course, I remember meeting you very well. And it's an absolute honor to be back here and surrounded by so many inspirational people. I am, I'm already really excited about this conference. Thank you. I will time myself <laughs> to hope to stay on time. So, and hopefully the, the um, PowerPoint will behave. There we go. So just to begin with a uh, short video.
So I'm, I've been invited here to share some experiences from this project, this very large project, EU LAC Museums, but in particular to speak to um, experiences from Peru and Costa Rica. So I have um, used up half of my time with the video, which I hope give you a sense of the collaborations that were made possible between Europe and Latin America. And now I'll say a little bit more in depth about case studies from Peru and Costa Rica. So in Peru, um, the team, which was based in the Pontifical Catholic University, worked with a number of museums and one of them was an eco-museum. So Museo de Cito Tucumé is an eco-museum located in the north of Peru in a desertous region, identified mainly because a lot of projects working in Peru would center around um, Lima and the major sites. And in this case, our um, principal investigator, Luis Serpeto, wanted to work with the north. So this is um, a picture from Tucumé Eco Museum, an activity that a lot of eco museums would engage in, mapping the local territory and significant sites and animals and foodstuffs that were important to the local community. So a big focus of this work was intergenerational transmission of knowledge, getting to know your territory and working with schools. The Museum highlighted in the video was Chan Chan, which is a much bigger museum and better known through tourist circles. But in this case, it was a unique opportunity to work with local schools around ideas of local biodiversity and also traditional crafts. In this case, adobe brick making um, being enjoyed by the local school. Also working with women's groups and local groups for traditional crafts such as chicha making, um, which you can see here. And by the end of this series of workshops, the team in Peru promoted also a workshop on micro enterprise, um, which encouraged the participants to think about ways to set up a small enterprise and to make some income from the goods that they were creating based on the traditional knowledge. So in relation to sustainable development, climate change, just after the project had begun, not long afterwards, there was uh, the large El Nino of 2017. And this became a focus of our project following a hiatus to the work of Peru that became quite significant. And so the project adapted a little bit and ran disaster workshops in Peru, as you can see here from this photograph, linking in with the sustainable development goals um, with the different actors involved in disaster preparedness and also disaster response. In the video, I highlighted the important collaboration that happened between Spain and Peru, in this case, thinking about traditional systems of governance around water, how to manage water. Um, this is the Corongo water judges in northern Peru and the Valencian water judges dressed in black. The, the, um, the resolution referred to already, I'm sure some of you have seen it before, but I did just want to emphasize in this forum that the idea um, for including reference to the UN 2030 goals and climate justice was heavily promoted by our dear friend, Luis Repetto from Peru, who sadly um, has now passed away. So I just want to say quickly that um, I'm working on another project now with Peru following the EU LAC Museum's ending, this case with a geographer in our university, Nina Lauri, who looks specifically at, La, at um, El Nino in the north of Peru, working with a local school. I'm running out of time. So just to say quickly, we've seen the Costa Rica case study in the video. In this case, we worked mainly on a youth exchange in conjunction with an eco-museum and two community museums. As you can see, there are a whole range of activities for the young people to get to know each other in this really um, significant and life-changing cultural exchange. But again, climate change had an impact. And you can see here the impact of the floods again in 2017 from Hurricane Nate that were responded to in this case by one of our project advisors, Samuel Franco. Um, and here you can see again, there was more flooding in 2020 and this has become a priority then for Costa Rica. And you can see some images here of the cleanup 
And so in response to this, we are collaborating once again with the National Museum of Costa Rica, the Network of Community Museums of Costa Rica, which in turn is connected to the, the Network of Community Museums of America, um, to assist in this process with a bottom-up um, initiative very much led by the communities themselves, where they are building a community garden in a paddock of the school. And so we have researchers from develop, sustainable development, memory studies, heritage studies and museum studies all working together on this initiative. And I just thought it would be worth mentioning that EU LAC museums didn't just stop with a full stop, that we are carrying on. And I'm over time, so I think I'd better stop. Thank you so much for listening. Fantastic, fantastic, Karen. I saw a photograph of Valencia, Tribunal de Agua, you remember, with the Water Museums Net. Well, I think that EQ museums all over the world could be different, but something unites them, which is the identity of people who are called even to fight against the climate challenge. I think this is very important. Everything is connected. Now I pass the word to, hey, my dear, ah, no, 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 I could hear. Oscar Navajas Corral, uh, who is um, a doctor in history and museology from the University of Alcala, Madrid. And now he is a deputy director and lecturer in the Department of History and Philosophy at the University of Alcala. Well, uh, his uh, curriculum is very long. I could, I could say that we need more days to read it. <laughs> but anyway, where, where are you, Carl, Oscar? I give you the, the, the word. Where are you? Um, I'm here. Oh, I see you. Could you listen? Yes, yes. Yes. Right. Hi. Good afternoon. <laughs> Buongiorno. Buongiorno. Ciao. 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 <laughs> okay. Uh, could I share my screen, please? Or oh, I can compartir. Ah, yes. Oof, where is, where is, where is this one? <clears throat> okay. Okay, could you see it? Yes, I see. Yes? It. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Um, uh, well, thank you very much for the invitation to this uh conference i am really happy i'm tired because i uh, finished my classes today so <laughs> i try to concentrate in in the presentation sorry take for the the mistake take it easy <laughs> okay sorry for the mistake okay mm. uh, the first one is to present uh, how is the panorama of the uh, they come museums in Spain. Uh, <clears throat> most of you know this presentation because we share the um, Eco Heritage project. But for the other people, the uh, <clears throat> panorama of Spanish eco museums is around uh, 120 eco museums in Spain, <clears throat> but only uh, 92 is open. And most of them are in the south in the south of Spain, Andalusia, and in the middle, so in Castilla, Castilla León and Catalonia is the best, the best practice. Uh, our panorama is not like an um, Italian panorama because we don't have uh, law about the museums. There are no um, official recon reconocimiento, 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 I don't know. The main data of our eco museums is uh, the nature of uh, this institution is uh, most of them are public institutions. So they they founding um, give from the from from the um, public administrations so or the <clears throat> the tax, and the less of our eco museum uh, belong to the private institution. The main purpose of this institution the of the object you know, the mission is a social participation, new models for the local economy. They are close to the um, cultural industries or creative industries, very related with the 
theories of um, creative class of uh, uh, Richard Florida. And most of them is the related to the territory, heritage, and of course, biodiversity and sustainability. And the main heritage to conserve or to, um, uh, to, to, to um, yes, to conserve is the landscape, countryside, uh, traditional craft, biodiversity, etc. But it's very important in our eco museum, there are a mentality <clears throat> to um, achieve a new resource, resource in funding, resource in research, uh, new models of research and to give uh, funding for uh, maintain the institution. So related with the um, goals of sustainability is the G, uh, the, the, our ecomuseums normally work with the uh, <clears throat> four, five and 50 uh, SDG um, sustainability is quality education, gender equality and life on land. Uh, the middle of uh, the half of the eco museums implement the um, UNESCO and ONU and UN, UN sorry, SDG in their activities, but uh, no um, exclusive activities in the DJ if it's related with other uh, activities of the eco museum. This is a uh, the 16 SDG, UNESCO SDG about the, uh, sustainability <clears throat> and uh, quality education is the most important. The second is uh, bio uh, ecosystem life in the land, life and, and, and territory. <clears throat> and this one, I don't remember. Don't remember. Ah, this is the activities created with about the uh, related with the SDG and activity of eco museums. Um, it's very particular. Uh, there are no uh, exclusive activity uh, related with the ecological SDG from UNESCO and National Union. The reason. In most of our eco museum um, is that they think uh, um, I don't know how to explain. I think I I prefer to to read because it's better in the next. Okay, here this is a quote of, uh, right with uh, by Barin and eco museums like other museological typologies uh, that promote community participation propose a change in the way of understanding the reason of being of museums uh, in society. It was proposed to transform the museological process into a means of direct participation of the individual and the community, as well as to offer a toll for the integral development of heritage and territory. Author uh, such as uh, Boylan, Hamrin and Hollander, Peter Davis, Corsan, uh, Pierre Meiran, etc., uh, carry out the research to know uh, the characteristic of eco museums from other types of museums community participation, museums without walls, institutions in, con in constant um, evolution at all for social, cultural, and economic development, etc., are some of its main characteristics. However, its social and democratic sense is what makes eco museums direct, directly related to the idea of sustainability. This is the reason that uh, the idea of sustainability is, I think, different in our eco museums panorama. 
The concept of Eco Museum, as created by Eutebarin, is constructed by means of the Greek word oikos, so house, home, or territory, <clears throat> or both, which makes the Eco Museums a tool for sustainability, sustainable local management strategies. For Eco Museums, sustainability is a relationship for actors, a geosystem consider us a set of biotic, abiotic and anthrop anthropic entities. <clears throat> Spanish ecomuseums today face new challenges, I think, uh, like other ecomuseums in other parts of the world. So climate change, degradation of natural space, spaces, social justice, demographically depressed in rural environments, etc. Many of them, our museums, are directly related to the 70s Sustainable Development Goals, so SDG. However, Eco Museum, at least uh, the Spanish ones, <clears throat> are small local museums with few material and economic resources, whose arm for sustainability is not the parameters of establishment by state or supra-state entities, such as uh, national unions or UNESCO, as has been reflected in this way, the several interviews carried out at the different Spanish museums, but for understanding, to understand these two elements for vital importance to them, so to our museums, one of them is the responsibility. For us, the sustainability start in the in the citizen responsibility in management, the heritage and the territory, so the museums. And the second one is understand the heritage, natural and cultural heritage, as a commons. Uh, in Spain, we speak about pro comun, but I think in English uh, is the commons. It's uh, far from the idea of a product the market system, the public and the private heritage. So it's related um, with the responsibility of the, the community, no um, only an, an establishment. And this is, I think is, this is all. Thank you very much. Grazie. I don't know if I, uh, it's too fast. Sorry. No, thank you, thank you, thank to you, uh, Oscar. I was impressed by the great concentration of eco museums in the south of Spain. Yes. There are two areas: the central one and the southern, Granada, Sevilla, I think. You know, wonderful, wonderful. On, and <laughs> this time, the south overleads the north. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Um, now uh, it is the stage of, ecco, Natalia, please pronounce the name of your Eco Museum because I don't know the Polish and I don't know where to start. Natalia Nimic Eco Museum GG in Italian, I don't know, Poland and Slovakia. But from uh, 2016, she worked uh, on a process of establishing a transnational cooperation, I think Poland, Slovakia as well, based on local heritage and tourism, which led to create a Polish Slovakian Eco Museum. Natalia, pronounce it because I can't. <laughs> Hi. Uh, yes, it's, it's difficult. Polish language is not easy. Uh, the Polish name of Eco Museum, Dziedzinę Dunajca, which means lands uh, of the Dunajec River, Eco Museum site. Um, I would like to invite you to Polish Slovakian cooperation based on national heritage, um, which is very young. Our Eco Museum was established uh, a few years ago. Um, I will show you a few pictures and a map which will help to show where we are. In a fantastic place, I saw. Eh? It is. Um, this is the view from my window, which I have every day. My dear. Um, we are on the south part of Poland. Um, 
close to the Tatra Mountain National Park, Inir National Park, Gorce National Park, Babiagura National Park, uh, and, every, uh, and we are uh, connected by the Dunai River, which in the past was on the border between the Poland and uh, Austria-Hungarian uh, Kingdom. And because we are very close to Slovakian border, um, we decided to uh, use the possibility of building cooperation with our Slovakian uh, neighbors. So our small eco museum, because it's really, really small, uh, it's connected with the transnational cooperation of the south part of Poland, plus a uh, few uh, Slovakian um, places. There are three regions connected with the mountains, uh, Pienines, Pishpot, Halle, and to Eco Museum belongs 35 places. Um, and um, most of the places um, are based on the tourism. So in short, in 2017, I started to cooperate with our uh, partner, Foundation uh, Mila from Krakow with Basha Kajor. And we started to map um, the places which we have in my region, which are uh, uh, connected with the local heritage. And because the region is very much becoming popular um, and it's becoming tourist destination, we wanted to prepare uh, the offer to show the tourists uh, our heritage, our um, not just the landscape, but also um, the culture uh, richness, which is very uh, big in uh, the region. Um, so it took us two years to meet with people, um, talk to them and uh, to find out that there is um, willingness to build such a cooperation. After two years, um, uh, those people from those places um, decided that they are ready to build such a cooperation. So in March, 2019, our Eco Museum was established. Uh, in 2020 uh, was the most busy year for us because we were running four projects um, uh, which help us to establish deeper cooperation between us and also to prepare the um, educational offer for uh, the kids, youth, and the tourists who are uh, visiting us. Uh, who creates Eco Museum Dijina Dunajca? Uh, mostly there are small tourist uh, industry. So the people who are offering accommodation and mostly this is the agro-tourist places which they produce their own food. Uh, also small restaurants and catering uh, places uh, which they produce their own food based on what we have in our region. And also um, local services helping to show the region and the area from the perspective of um, sport, like the bicycle places, kayak places, boat places, which you can rent and see the place um, in the more eco way. And also we have a small group of NGOs and culture community departments who are responsible for uh, organizing workshops, events, concerts, uh, showing the people um, our uh, local heritage, our rich culture, um, and also the dialects, because uh, in our Eco Museum, we have three dialects, um, which shows that in the past, we were in some way divided because of the borders. Um, I was thinking about how to show the sustainability um, in Eco Museum, and I decided, uh, and I divided in four places, uh, four uh, parts. Uh, ecological and local food, uh, educational workshops, eco traveling and sightseeing, and balanced and integral cooperation. Um, so, as I, met, as I mentioned, most of the places um, are the small uh, businesses uh, focused on tourism. Um, so, they are uh, interested in showing 
people who are visiting the region, um, not just the place, but also um, um, to promote uh, the ecological food, um, the ecological way of traveling. So this is the way, this is what we have. We have in our Eco Museum uh, uh, wine yard, we have uh, places where we produce the honeys. Um, trout, it's the uh, popular fish here. And also we have the shepherds. Um, it's like um, the profession, which is almost disappearing. And for half year, those people are taking care of the sheep on the highlands and they are producing milk and uh, cheese uh, from sheep. And also in our Eco Museum, we have a unusual member, uh, Akiko, uh, who is a Japanese lady and who have uh, moved here um, around 30 years ago. And she's using in her kitchen um, the local herbs, which she's finding in the forest where she's living. So she's combining the local um, uh, herbs, local plants with um, Japanese uh, meals. And she's also, I would say, uh, ambassador who is promoting ecology in her own village. She's showing how to um, make gardens and um, use the fruits and vegetables in the local meals. Um, and those people who are um, uh, visit, uh, who, who are hosting the tourists, they are also selling the local products um, to them. It's becoming more and more popular that uh, from the place which you are visiting, you would like to bring a kind of souvenir. And most people are focused on bringing healthy food uh, made by locals, um, uh, and they see um, the landscape. And they have this trust that this is uh, the food made in a uh, safety way. We are also thinking about um, educational uh, because it's really important for us to um, teach the kids, uh, our own kids from our places, and also the kids who are visiting us uh, about our uh, heritage. So we are organizing mostly the NGOs who are um, in Eco Museum, the handcraft workshops. So the kids can make their own uh, toys uh, from hay. They make their own carpets. We have also the cooking workshops when the ladies from the Women Association are showing uh, the uh, meals which were made by our greenies um like 100 years ago use of the local and very simple products um and they are also sharing the history and the stories how the people were living here um uh, how the life changed um also they are showing the small mini museum of the uh, household um uh furnitures uh, or the books uh, which you cannot see anymore in the house uh, houses right now. We also have a lady who is um, making her own honeys and she's uh, offering the workshops uh, to show uh, how bees are important, uh, how the honey is um, uh, prepared. So like the whole story from the bee to the jar of honey um, to make possible people who are uh, visiting us to know more about the history and the culture uh, which we have every day, we organized um, for free um, quest. So it's like the written story when you are starting from one place and uh, following the guides uh, in the text, you are discovering the stories and you are discovering um, another places. Uh, and those quests are uh, for the bikes. So the people who are cycling, they can uh, take a longer ride and uh, get to know the area. And also you can walk in one village or two villages. Uh, and it takes like one or two hours to discover where you are and discover the stories. Um, because we have such a beautiful uh, landscape where we live and we would like to promote the healthy lifestyle. 
So um, we uh, encourage people who are coming here and visiting us to travel, but travel by using bikes, boats, kayaks, and horses. We also have the offers for disabled people um, or seniors, so they can uh, travel um, around the lake with the cycling path uh, or special uh, electrical rickshaw. And we also focus on cooperation uh, with the partners. And one of our partner is National Park. Um, and for the, for the park, uh, we were an important partner because um, they saw the value in um, the educational part of our uh, Eco Museum. And they also are facing the struggle with too many tourists. And um, they see an Eco Museum possibility that the people who are coming here and visiting the area, they will be interested in uh, discovering another places and taking care of more of the nature. And we are also promoting uh, the vanishing professions and local, product, uh, lo local products, because those people are probably the last generation, um, like the shepherds, uh, who give their time and half of the year taking care uh, of the animals. It's very difficult and hardworking uh, work. Um, and thanks to that, we have uh, delicious and local products. So what we do? We are interested in balanced tourism development based on uh, increasing awareness by local community about, um, who cherish the value of heritage, nature, and culture. And in short, this is where uh, we are working, where we are living, and I would like to invite you. If you have chance to come to Poland, please feel welcome to contact me and I'll be more than happy to show you our place. Well, I thank you your invitation eh? because a wonderful landscape, wonderful. And uh, you saw your contribution was about uh, on a sort of a balance of tourist industries with awareness uh, through um, craftsmanship and uh, teaching the, the children, you know, to uh, to approach uh, traditions. It's wonderful, but a more wonderful is your landscape. Let's change the place, my dear. Now, I'm um, just the last, uh, but not, uh, not late, but, but so I don't know. Uh, Glenn Sutter, or Sutter, curator of human ecology and coordinator of songwriting for nature which uh, uh, raises my curiosity. Eh? Uh, he'll, um, the, he is a professor of geography and environmental studies at the University of Regina. So Suter or Sutter, it's up to you. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. It's Suter. Suter. And uh, I often get Sutter because of the way it's spelled. And but uh, I, appreciate, uh, I appreciate the attention to that. I usually have to correct people, but um, this is a, I'm very happy to be part of this group and uh, offer some thoughts about some of the work that's happening in this part of the world. Um, I don't manage an eco museum or, or work for an eco museum, but I've been studying them here and um, helping communities locally set them up and work with the idea. So I do have a few a few thoughts to share. And um, so rather than sort of drill down on one or two um, examples and go deep, I thought I would just take a, a look at what's happening across the country. Of course, Canada was very early adopter of the, of the very early involved in the, in the movement when eco museums first took root. So there is a bit of a history here that we all might be able to learn on, learn from. Um, I'm going to start my timer so I don't don't go over. Um, I enjoy this topic very much, so I, I might uh, I do tend to go on at length at times. Um, <clears throat> so I'm doing this work as a researcher and with a background in biology, ecology, and especially human ecology in the last the last half of my career. Um, and I really want to ask this question directly: whether um, there's potential for the Canadian muse eco museums to address climate change issues. And the, the, the rather unsatisfying answer I'll float out there is possibly, 
And I'll explain why I come down to that answer. There's certainly a lot of um, uh, awareness of issues across the country from uh, heat stress and disease to sea level concerns on the coast to um, effects of drought and um, water problems in the center of the province. Um, especially a lot of th concerns up north because that's where a lot of climate change impacts are happening. Um, and at the same time, uh, there's a, a reasonable level of awareness in parts of the country. The areas in red shown on this map are where uh, a number of, a high number of um, high percentage of adults think the earth is actually getting warmer. So when we compare that map where all the red is there too, where eco museums have actually taken root in this country, um, it looks fairly encouraging. You see the, the being from coast to coast with different examples. Um, not very, none up in the north, unfortunately, but um, at, at this point, it looks pretty promising that there's some potential for the eco museum model to shed light on climate change concerns. Um, there's some ex direct examples as well. And the, the famous eco museum in Montreal called Fier Monde um, had a wonderful traveling exhibit that looked at the challenges of living in a sustainable city. It, it was active for four, four to five years and um, toured the province of Quebec, um, shedding, providing important information, important experiences for people to reflect on climate change. And here in my province, Saskatchewan, we're right in the middle, very landlocked, very prairie and boreal forest focused. Um, there are a number of climate change motivators behind the work from uh, what, what um, forestry looks like under a, cl a changing climate to pressures on farming and especially concerns about water. We're very dry in this part of the world. Um, <clears throat> all of our water comes from the, uh, the glaciers in the Rocky Mountains to the west and those glaciers are disappearing. So it's um, a pretty clear uh, cause and effect that we can point to around climate change and water. There are some specific examples here in the province, uh, an eco museum fairly close to where I work here in Regina, uh, called, called the White City Museum, uh, has done some fantastic work on getting school groups out to understand their local heritage and um, including indigenous perspectives on that heritage. Um, interestingly though, the landowner where this um, project takes place is um, it doesn't really think climate change is a concern. So the the museum had to work in that part of the of the project and um, did it anyway. Also, we have the Calling Lakes Eco Museum, also in this uh, the southern part of the province, and uh, they're all about water quality. So, while climate change is not really uh, front and center in their work, it certainly informs what they're trying to do to raise awareness. But my short answer is that there is some potential here in Canada, but um, there's not likely, uh, Canadian eco museums are not likely to do much at this point. And the reason is um, that where, whereas you saw that first map, that the, there've been a number of applications of the model across the country, uh, most of those have focused on tourism, uh, just attracting people and, and money, uh, not with, a, with very little focus on climate and importantly, most of those early projects are not, not active anymore. If you look at this version of that same map, the red dots are sites which have become dormant or transitioned to something else. Um, there's simply not a lot of activity in those parts of the country. Uh, whereas the green dots are currently um, operating as eco museums. Um, and just to drill down on that point, uh, if you see here, they where a lot of the activity is happening here in the prairies, that correlates with um, part of that earlier map where the percentage of adults concerned with about climate change is relatively low. So it's a bit of a hard slog here um, for, for that reason. And as well, if we sort of step back, there's no organizing network across the country that would uh, galvanize an eco museum movement here, uh, whereas other, Organizations like the Canadian Museums Association and others 
um, they have other priorities and they've very, been very slow to change course and to recognize the, the, the value of something like an eco-museum. Um, and I think part of that might have to do with underlying cultural hurdles, which I've sort of depicted here with the, the famous great chain of being where humans are split off from nature and, and just, uh, just one step away from God. It's um, this, this kind of, this kind of uh, linear, very disconnected thinking is, is dominant in, in this part of the world. And it, it encourages people to think more as individuals and within their comfortable silos more than working across those boundaries. Um, and certainly here on the, on, in a, a colonized colonial um, economy like we have in, across much of North America, there continues to be a lot of frontier thinking that uh, we have a wilderness to be tamed. And, um, and that in, in these settings, it's very difficult for a more embracing holistic idea like an Eco Museum to take root. Um, <clears throat> but I think there's room for optimism. I don't want to leave on a, on a bad note um, for a couple of reasons. Here in my province, the, uh, the emerging network of Eco Museums is supported by an active association and their, uh, their work is also supported by a, a robust advisory group, so which is very aware of climate change issues. So the potential for climate change to be addressed is, is very high. Um, and also we're doing a lot to encourage the adoption or the um, learning from indigenous ways of knowing where there's, they don't have that great chain of being, it's more of a collective a holistic, um, uh, very much ecological, not ego-driven, as a uh, lot many economies tend to be. And you can see in this depiction of indigenized, indigenized ways of knowing, there are, there are plenty of places for um, robust, holistic projects to take root. Um, <clears throat> we've also learned a few things about how to develop eco museums and how to avoid pitfalls. You know, it's, and much of this will be familiar to all of you that um, it's important to build wide support. Um, it's important to avoid falling back on the sort of traditional museum practices, put more emphasis on local engagement. Um, it's, tempt it's tempting to become very complex as an institution and ossified, so it's important to stay flexible. And <clears throat> whereas you're Whereas if you're being motivated by non-climate issues, I think the trick there is to make sure that climate action is included in everything that you do, because it really is included in everything. Uh, and the last thing is that um, there are many pathways we can look at if we want to actually talk about cultural revitalization. Um, and the one we're going to be focusing on soon is local food and food security uh, and climate change with its impacts on water is a natural place for us to uh, to do more work. I think that's my time. Fantastic, Suter. I was impressed by uh, your phrase when you speak about disciplinary silos. Hmm. Fantastic, because the uh, Eco Museum on, on the country is a combination of different aspects. And another uh, sentence which impressed me is when you speak about nature which is imbued with spirit. So mm. this remembers me, uh, the Redskins. I think that they are <laughs> the Eco Museum, the best Eco Museum operators of the world. Absolutely, uh, yes. Nature has a spirit. Well, I finished my, Nunti, I finished my session, se session. I think we are in time. And I, I thank very much all the speakers because they gave their contribution in exactly eight and 10 minutes. Fantastic. Now we have to elaborate what they told us. What, uh, only two key words, which uh, according to me uh, went out is awareness, people awareness. People should be aware of their heritage transmission, education, in, a, in a one word, the heritage, which is 
something we have to pass to the next generation. So we have to preserve our world, our nature. We should live well, and we should uh, give it as we received, as Varadkin said once upon a time. Nuncia, it's up to you. Okay. Thank you very much to everybody for your wonderful presentation. I'm very happy you were in time and you said a lot of very interesting things. Thank you very much, Edo, for your coordination. You are perfect, you, you are perfect in your rule. And so I'm, I'd like to say super thank you to you too. Uh, now I think that we can move uh, um, from the third session that is about the climate as a global heritage the museum's role. Uh, this third session is coordinated by Lisa Picozzi. She is a research fellow at the University of Milano Bicocca for the Eco Heritage Project. Okay, Lisa, this is your time. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you, Nunzia, and a good afternoon to everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. And uh, now it's time for the third section, uh, Climate Change as a Global Heritage, the Museum Role. And uh, in this section, uh, um, it will be deep and investigate uh, the role of museums uh, in climate action activities. So each speaker will have 10 minutes for a presentation. And uh, let's start uh, with the first uh, speaker, Douglas Wurtz. And uh, he is a culture and sustainability specialist uh, from Canada. So, Douglas, uh, um, I leave the floor to you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. And um, I'm thrilled to be part of this uh, very progressive um, global sharing uh, venue. I've come to expect that of the Echo Museum. Uh, world um, and it uh, it continues to deliver and thanks too for Glenn to Glenn for his inspiring and and sometimes sobering uh, reflections because I think they're the way we actually get to uh, move to success um, I'm just going to start my timer and uh, I'm going to share my screen um, uh, and I want this and okay. and how do I make this full size now? Um, uh, anybody know? Uh, you have to start uh, the presentation above, I think, uh, the PowerPoint uh, on the uh, right side oh. of the screen. Okay, yes, there we okay. go. All right, thank you. <clears throat> I'm Douglas no, Worth. I, I live in Toronto, Canada, which I want to acknowledge sits upon the ancestral land of Indigenous peoples, uh, specifically the Huron, the Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. I should also note that today, September 30th, is Canada's first National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. This national holiday is one step along the lengthy path of Canada healing its historically troubled relationship with Indigenous peoples. I've been in the museum field for over 45 years, mostly in conventional museums. And during the 1980s, I learned about the work of eco museums and realized something was missing in traditional museum practice. Museums uh, or eco museums seem to evolve, have evolved out of a more holistic, local living cultural reality and they're designed to meet the evolving needs of that culture. And so to me, the heart of the issue is really, can museums become catalysts of cultural adaptation, change in our fast changing world? And I believe that they can, like Glenn, uh, not without some challenges. Um, if they truly embrace the expansive idea of nurturing the muses, right across society to cultivate reflection, creativity, insight, wisdom, and more, they can, <clears throat> in fact, be catalysts of uh, cultural adaptation. And to that end, I created a tool um, to help museums plan for impacts um, that would be felt in the living culture, not simply within the walls of museums. 
The inside-outside model um, helps foster new conversations about leveraging inside museum resources in ways that have cultural impacts in the culture outside the museum. And all of this resonates, I think, um, with the ambitions of the UN SDGs in their far-reaching and uh, uh, interdependent um, nature. So now I want to introduce you to the inside-outside model. All right, so how do we, there we go. <clears throat> All right, so uh, we're going to begin with a fairly simple um, vision and image here of, uh, of the world with the natural environment uh, containing a society, um, which, and the society is a sub, um, a subset of the environment and the economy is a subset of the society. And I placed in the center cultural and, and heritage organizations um, because that's our topic today. And just wondering, there we go. Okay. And I, I also imagine that the overarching goal of heritage and uh, cultural organizations is to add value and well being to communities. Um, and with regard to sustainability, um, I think that we have to be clear that we have to generate net positive social and environmental impacts along the way. And there are a lot of museums now that are particularly because of climate change becoming quite active in uh, in doing this kind of work. And so they quite naturally turn. Um, oh, first of all, just to acknowledge that these issues in the environment um, are are becoming clear. It's not only climate change, it's ocean acidification, um, pollution, loss of biodiversity, etc. The climate change is a uh, particularly it's sort of at the top of the list. Um, uh, but also, if we look inside these museums um, that are beginning to do this kind of work, we often find that they look for the things that they can do. That makes sense. And they look to things like energy efficient retrofits, waste minimization. How do they? How can they lower their greenhouse gas emissions? Um, all of which makes sense and is all uh, very positive. But they also know that these big issues, whether it is climate change or it's um, uh, the problem of systemic um, inequity and racism, are looking hard at their own structures of staffing and board and governance um, to look at diversification. They're also developing some new planning processes um, and wondering about what skills might they, what they need. Um, they want to plan. Uh, many are coming to the realization that they actually want to plan for cultural impacts. Well, what does that mean to actually uh, have cultural impacts? And that in part means you need to understand what are the cultural needs? What are the realities? What are the dynamics, the complexities? And where are you going to actually have those impacts? It requires a lot of effective planning. So. <clears throat> which brings me to the heart of um, the the inside outside model, which is um, really a um, I'm just gonna try and get rid of that um, a look at the the outer world, the living culture, and uh, here we find um, that there is a familiar first place to turn, and that is. It, in what way do we have impacts on individuals? And I think anyone who works with um, uh, visitors and the public uh, within museums knows, <clears throat> knows that um, when individuals are engaged in really productive ways, their um, curiosity is stimulated. There is self-reflection that is nurtured. They begin to look at their own values, their own behaviors um, in a reflective way. Um, they might become creative. Um, they might discover a, a, an empathetic way of looking at the world that hadn't been the case before. They might acquire new knowledge. Uh, this may or may not be the knowledge that was intended by the uh, exhibits, um, because lots of things are, are happening co-creatively when um, people interact with museums. And museums, I think, know far less about what happens co-creatively um, than they do about the messages that they're trying to push out into the world. Ultimately, when individuals are engaged, it can lead to responsible action. 
individuals. But individuals isn't the only way to look at um, how museums can affect um, the, the living culture. If we look at groups, which are collections of individuals, the needs are somewhat different. There is a need to uh, foster dialogue. How well do these groups actually work? Um, is there respect within the group? How do you cultivate trust within groups? Um, does the, do these groups understand where they've come from, their history? Uh, do they have a vision? Do they share a vision? Um, and do they have ways to enhance cohesion, uh, both within and between groups? These are all issues that um, are, are possible for museums to work towards. And at a higher level of complexity, we get into communities and neighborhoods, uh, which may include many different groups. Um, and, and so then we're also looking at issues of, um, uh, is there equity uh, across all of these um, uh, communities and within the, the different groups that are contained within it? How do you build cohesion within the communities and groups? Um, how do you generate trust? A lot of it really requires that there is relationship um, because the, at the heart of culture is relationship. And uh, it's not just a matter of um, information and what you know, but it's how you develop that relationship um, of trust and respect. Um, and Sorry, we, Douglas. Yes? You have left uh, two minutes. Two minutes, okay. Um, and so beyond that um, is uh, organizations, which are all part of our um, uh, social reality. And, uh, and so, but progressive businesses are very interesting in how they've generated uh, a, an insight into the profit first um, uh, approach is, is not enough. Um, we need to find net positive impacts across social, environmental, and economic dimensions. And I think museums can learn something from how some of those businesses are looking at developing sustainable business models. And then there's cities, which are more complex yet again, looking at issues of food security, energy, uh, sustainable energy, etc. Um, um, and participatory democracy is going to be vital. And if we look at the perhaps the most challenging area, it's looking at human systems. Can our cultural organizations help become reflective and change oriented um, to transform our human systems and the economy is a huge one um, we don't tend to know a lot about it but it's an important place to focus also social systems um, of equity and justice and governance in participatory democracy so these are these are just some they aren't it's not comprehensive but it's a framework um, that uh, um, where all of the component parts are actually interdependent and uh, interactive. Um, and, uh, and also within the larger model, the environmental, the inside uh, museum, and all of the elements of the outside are um, interactive. This leads us to the uh, reality that in many instances, cultural and heritage organizations need new visions, new measures of success and new strategies. This is the challenge. And I think it's why Glenn has suggested it's a, a difficult um, challenge ahead, but it is a place for optimism. So many thank you for your interest. Uh, thank you very much, Douglas. Uh, it was very interesting, uh, your uh, presentation and your reflection. And uh, uh, now it's time for uh, uh, Harry McGee. Uh, so Harry is a um, member is a member of Reimagining a Museum for Climate Action, and also member of ICOM International Working Group on Sustainability, and uh, he's from UK. So uh, Harry, welcome. You will have uh, ten minutes for your presentation and I will advise you, uh, I will inform you uh, when you will have uh, three minutes left. Okay, uh, thanks Lisa and uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here um, today. Um, it's a fantastic event um, for a few reasons, because it's a partnership between different countries, different forms of museums. Um, it links with um, COP26, 
but is also a reflection of, you know, both what we're trying to do within museums and between museums and with other sectors is great. Um, and so because I've got a little bit of time at the end to talk about the sustainable development goals, I'll, I'll, I'll save some of, some of this for, for, for that time. But I would think I would just mention now that um, it's great to hear from some of the different presentations, um, the different approaches to using the goals, because I just to emphasize that, of course, the goals are just the latest in a within a 70 year long struggle, really, to build a build a better world. Um, personally, I, I've been I've been working with the goals for uh, since about 2016. Um, and the way I tend to do this is I, I write these guides that you can see on the right hand side there. You can get them for free um, to help um, uh, museums and their partners to get started with these sustainable development approaches, because it has to be said that it is quite, quite new for a lot, lot of museums and, and those who work in them. But I think the great th the, the thing that's, that I would like to point out is the really the incredible uh, innovation that the goals were like to look at goal-based approaches as a way of breaking through, you know, the inertia of, you know, treaties and um, conventions and so on. The goals, they, they're a kind of shorthand that help us connect with one another and really, you know, work, work on shared, shared challenges. But I thought I would return um, back to, to 1972, really, to the, to the, the time of the birth of, of um, eco-museums. And this is from the round table of Santiago de Chile, very famous meeting. And I'd just like to read this quote out um, that from this, from this meeting where there were people um, from within the museum sector and people working on sustainable development, that the first paper by one of these um, outsiders was like a bombshell. When the speaker had finished, we museologists looked at one another confounded, not by so much by what had been said, but because it had been, ma been made obvious to us at one stroke that the existence, sorrows, longings and hopes of mankind, humankind, were not getting into the museums. We realised that the museum is grafted onto the tree of society, but it is nothing unless it gets from the host trunk the vital sap that has its origin in the fields, the workshops, laboratories and schools, homes and towns. And I mean, I, I, I love a, a good quote and I think it's a fantastic quote and um, it reminds me very much of the diagram that Nunzia showed at the start of this um, webinar, you know, that think, you know, thinking of these things as a, as a tree, as a, an ecological metaphor. But we can also think that we're now 50 years on from that time. And that time, uh, 1972, was also the time of the, Ste the Stockholm Declaration. You know, there was a lot of awareness then that you know humankind and, and the environment were not kind of working you know as they should do so as we enter into 2022 next year we need to be looking at well how can we make sure that the next 50 in 50 years time we're not having having the same discussion how do we reset and reboot and so just to give a very quick um overview of this this idea of the the um, climate as a as a shared heritage. Uh, it was actually put forward by a Maltese um, academic in the 1980s. Um, the, the common heritage of, of mankind is a legal principle. Um, it's thought of in relation to the seafloor or to outer space um, or to um, uh, radio waves. And it is it's a it's a concept that's that's very much linked with the sense of an, an, an environmental commons. And actually, that, that concept of, of climate as a shared global heritage actually helped set the whole thing rolling for the Framework Convention on Climate Change, which was adopted in, in 1992 at the, at the Rio Earth Summit. And it's worth saying that mu music, so the, the countries that signed up to that convention in 1992, they've met every year since 1995 when it came into force. And the next meeting will be in Glasgow in in, in, a, in a month's time from today, actually. Um, and we can say that museums are often involved in the public aspect of the COP, and the, the bottom image there shows the Prado in Madrid when they had um, a few projects on for, for COP25 in December 2019. Um, and I can say that museum perspectives have been included in these conferences and consultations since 2017, and some of us have been involved in those. 
Um, I'd like to say as a result of that, um, and the, through the partnership work, work with UN Climate Change, um, museums, cultural and educational institutions were specifically mentioned in the, in the work programme for the Paris Agreement at COP24 in 2018 in Poland. Um, and then the next year, we see the ICOM members adopt two resolutions on museums and sustainability. And so there is a lot of goodwill and there are some, some things are happening, but we have to accept as well, emissions continue to rise. Something needs to change. And so within the Paris Agreement and the original framework convention, um, it, talk, it has an article called, called Action for Climate Empowerment. It talks about the importance of education, training staff, public awareness, public participation, public access to information, and international cooperation on climate change matters. And when I see the, that list of six things, I just think museums. We need to look for the ways to, to embed those into our local communities so that communities are, uh, have a, a, are empowered to, to participate in these. I'll mention briefly a, a project that I'm working on as part of a team headed up by Rodney Harrison at University College London. Um, last year, we launched a design and ideas competition. Um, we had 264 submissions from 48 countries, which was quite incredible because it's through all this COVID time. And we have an exhibition at Glasgow Science Centre, which will be, will be the green zone for, for COP26. And so we have this um, website of additional inspirations and other resources that we aim you know, to help uh, to provide to the museum sector and their partners afterwards. And we've got a, a book and a, a toolkit coming soon. That's a picture of the Glasgow Science Centre is very futuristic. And I just thought I would show you a couple of examples here um, of the exhibits that are on show in, from this competition. And these will be really familiar territory to eco museum people. So what if we thought of museums as small places that supported communities in addressing local climate challenges and actions? So looking at um, places that are hyper local, um, this is developed by a team in Brazil um, and their project is called Existances. So it's, a, it's a, a combination of existence and resistance because it's uh, local communities, including indigenous communities, um, who, who basically have to struggle against um, great, you know, bigger, more powerful forces and um, communities which um, draw heavily on oral traditions for, um, for agriculture that have um, spiritual connections with nature and landscape. And these, this, the exhibit shows these as small models and I particularly like the image on the right hand side there. Um, looks across to that the building that looks a bit like an armadillo is is is, is called the armadillo it's where cop 26 will be in in a month's time and just that sense of the connection between the hyper local and these policy agendas is is kind of rings a rings a bell with me strikes a chord sorry Ari, you will have uh, two minutes left that's fine thank you um, what again, if we were to think of indigenous lands as a kind of museum for climate action. So again, something that will be familiar, very familiar to people working in eco museums. So one, the challenge of traditional museums is they often they dispossess indigenous communities of their cultural heritage. They have no access to it. So what if you instead just forget about that sense that the indigenous people are the, um, the, the curators and the experts who um, interpret the landscape and their ways of life for, for, for others, for visitors. Or again, what if we were to use um, some of the traditional museum approaches, collecting, uh, documentation and interpretation, but instead those were done by the communities. Um, so rather than climate change being, a, as it so often is, a, a world of, uh, graphs and data and figures we're actually people we're, we're ultimately talking about people's lives and um that what if people could you, you know use some of these approaches and the museum instead was a place where community where groups come together to talk about their experience of climate change not just as a documentation of what is happening 
but with the name of, of empowering themselves and one another to, you know, collectively to, to act. And I think I would just pick up on a point that somebody made previously about um, addressing climate change. And we can think about that in its two senses of addressing it, meaning we just talk about it or, or addressing it in the sense of we do something about it, either reducing emissions or empowering ourselves and others to live with the impacts. And I'll just mention briefly a, a, another project I'm involved in that's that's run by an organisation called ICROM, um, called Our Collections Matter. And this is um, aimed at uh, collections-based institutions, but would also have an awful lot of re relevance and resonance with, with other um, forms of museum, including Echo Museum. And so what we've, because I'm, I'm the, working as the consultant on this, what we've done is like to take typical um, uh, heritage and cultural activities and to line them up with the SDGs because people are up, often unclear on what the connection is. Um, you can, it's available on the, on the web, on the internet, it's, it's very easy to find. You can either search it in terms of the five Ps uh, of sustainable development of the activities down the left hand side by, by the goal or by any particular targets that you might be interested in. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Henry. So uh, you talk, uh, talked about uh, indigenous culture too, like uh, the other colleague, and maybe there will be a good point uh, to for reflection of, after the conclusion. So thank you very much. And uh, now it's time uh, for Michela Rota. Welcome, Michela. Michela is a member of ICOM, uh, of the International Working Group on Sustainability from Italy, and she works uh, on a project uh, uh, and the researches with the sustainability at, at the core. So uh, I leave the floor to you, Michela, and uh, you will have uh, 10 minutes, and I will inform you when you, left, you have left uh, free. Maybe. Thank you. Thank you. Dear Hall, thank you very much for the invitation in this very important collective moment. Uh, I'm talking from Torino, Italy, and uh, I'm happy to share with you some uh, activities that uh, the ICOM Working Group on Sustainability is carrying out, and also an Italian research uh, project uh, called the Musei Integrati. Um, I totally agree with uh, the richness of the messages uh, that shared uh, in the sessions. And also in my book, uh, Museums for the Integrated Sustainability, um, I have deepened how museums can become more sustainable, what does it mean, which is their role for people and the planet concerning the building, uh, the governance, uh, the, the exhibitions, so the activities and programs in relationship with communities and places. And so I contribute with my colleagues in helping the process developing a series of methodologies and practices. Uh, I, I'm speaking today also as a member of uh, the ICOM Working Group on Sustainability, and we know that ICOM um, places the Agenda 2030 at the heart of its activities. Uh, in the opening session, uh, the President Alberto Garlandini has highlighted the, the commitment of ICOM for the climate crisis, the Sustainable Development Goal, Paris Agreement, and biodiversity. The effort uh, of our working group uh, really since the beginning, the 20, in, uh, in 2018, is dedicated to help uh, HICOM Executive Board uh, consider how to mainstream sustainable SDGs and the Paris Agreement and to support its members uh, to contribute constructively in upholding the SDGs. And uh, be between the, the different activities, we are also discussing how to start improving these uh, uh, resolution number one on sustainability, also mentioned it before, released in the 2019. Uh, it's now time to have this critical thinking that we have heard before, and uh, we need to improve uh, some strategies. And also we are discussing, uh, addressing also Prague, uh, the Prague Con General Conference uh, next year. Um, we are discussing how to contribute 
route to the creation of new narratives uh, within museums uh, for a shift uh, of, of priorities uh, towards sustainability. And uh, with its global network, ICOM is well placed uh, uh, to facilitate the telling with also other organizations, institutions, uh, and uh, associations. For example, uh, we have the IPCC uh, AR6 uh, final report. Um, we have uh, read the climate, price, uh, climate change report and uh, that includes uh, uh, adaptation, mitigation strategies uh, and um, next year in September has to be published. So um, maybe this might be a suitable topic uh, to begin developing such a new narrative. Uh, we, we are thinking about it. And um, for example, uh, in which museums around the world will be transforming into arenas for public participation, debates, exhibitions, and events uh, organized in-house or in cooperation with local communities. A vision of museums uh, as uh, a view, as we have heard, catalysts for change, enhancing public awareness uh, and uh, inspiring public action and contributing to the goal of attaining a sustainable future. We all agree about this role of museums and eco museums together uh, to contribute uh, uh, and sensibilize uh, society and work together. I want uh, uh, to um, uh, present uh, an Italian project called Musei Integrati, Integrated Museums, uh, uh, where also ICOM Italy is present as a, a partner. And um, it's about how museums and similar cultural institutions can make a contribution to the SDGs and local sustainable development and also contribute to a systemic change of the cultural ecosystem. This project uh, is a result of a is winner of uh, the call uh, um, of the Ministry of Ecological Transition for the implementation and promotion of the national Italian national strategy for sustainable development. And um, the partners, uh, the leading partner is the MUSE, Science Museum of Trento, um, in, uh, in, with uh, ICOM Italy and the uh, National Association of uh, Scientific Museums. In, uh, in particular, this uh, project uh, uh, intends to create a space uh, for discussion, exchange of practices and study with different outcomes on sustainable development topics uh, and sustainability. Um, to integrate also the activist museums within the urban agendas for local development, to create a link with the places with the stakeholders, and to promote uh, uh, the role of museums uh, as civic and cultural platforms uh, that operate uh, in, in close relationship with institutions and citizens. It's related also to the concept of extended museum, um, and encourage uh, museums as community spaces for dialogue and knowledge construction to foster public engagement in care of people, society, and planet through their operation and public programs. Uh, in general, uh, we have uh, four more tar four, um, specific targets. The first one is related to create a, a network of museums engaged with sustainability. And we have created uh, the Italian Working Group on Sustainability uh, at the moment linked with this project. And um, also the second, uh, the second target is really the core of the research uh, um, to experiment the methodology with uh, 30, more or less 30 museums uh, that um, have been chosen uh, with uh, a tenor geographically uh, uh, in all the parts uh, of Italy, uh, different type, typology of museums, uh, uh, different um, uh, kind of governance, uh, uh, and uh, also museums, uh, big, small, uh, heterogeneous uh, choose of museums. 
choice of museums. And uh, um, in this part, uh, we are discussing and we have organized six laboratories for discussion, starting from a master class on some topics, and then uh, focus groups to improve uh, the dialogue between uh, uh, colleagues and professionals, uh, also about the museology of sustainability, um, about what can be improved. Um, and uh, uh, the third target is more related to the uh, promote uh, the orientation with the public. So the museum with the, the places, the, the, um, uh, the concept of the extended museums uh, to discuss how to promote uh, also with uh, workshops, uh, with uh, the public and stakeholders uh, these topics it's because the laboratories are about also anthropocene future studies green transition and uh, uh, for the third target is to create uh, strategic partnerships with uh, between these projects is within the with the ministry of the ecological transition but we want more alliances uh, uh, to improve uh, uh, create an impact in, uh, we know that uh, the, the number of museums dedicated to sustainable development concerning different aspects uh, is increasing rapidly, uh, but uh, we need uh, systemic uh, changes and uh, systemic partnerships uh, at the national and local level and uh, for the participation also in policy making strategies uh, to create an impact. We know that at the moment, even if there are so many museums doing a lot of things, uh, we know that uh, people also uh, think that museums are still seen as static places uh, when uh, really they are just the opposite. But uh, a lot of things can be improved and achieved at the level of the single institution and uh, in terms of systemic uh, change to generate this impact. I recall here the ICOM motto, uh, which is museums have no borders. We are all part of an ecosystem participating to improve uh, how cultural like museums and museums can become more sustainable. At the same time, we recognize that we need culture to create the path for the change and the transition that we have to face as society nowadays. And uh, sorry, agenda. Michaela. Yes. Sorry, Michaela, you, you have uh, two minutes left. One minute. <laughs> Agenda 2030, but not only asks to that all the parts of the society and institutions contribute. And the culture is a sector that has to be sustainable in itself, transforming the extractive approach that has led us to the present crisis. And also at the time, at the same time, is a vector for new narratives, a new way of living. So it's at the core of everything, culture. It's all about culture. So I, I, I just say, let's do it together. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Michela. Uh, sorry if I stop you, you are almost finished. And the uh, Musei Integrati, uh, it's very interesting and can be a pillar project for uh, uh, sharing uh, sustainability with museums and uh, and so thank you for, uh, for your uh, presentation. And uh, now it's the time for Nunzia Borrelli. Uh, it, it, she's a professor of sustainable uh, tourism in Bicocca University. And she also uh, did uh, field research uh, on uh, eco museums, uh, museums tourism um, in Italy, UK, USA, and China. So, uh, Nuncia, I leave the floor to you, and uh, you will have uh, 10 minutes, uh, and I will inform you when you have uh, two minutes left. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa, and uh, thank you very much to all speakers that uh, present to me uh, for being in time and for giving me a lot of suggestions and a lot of stimuli. Okay, um, I'm going to share my presentation. Anyway, 
As you can see from the title of my PowerPoint presentation, the main aim of my contribution is to discuss how eco-museums can foster sustainable development goals and if training programs can contribute to make eco-museums more effective in implementing sustainable development goals and climate action. In order to reach such aim, I'm going to present the eco-heritage project and in particular uh, a survey that is a part of the Eco Heritage Project and that was carried out during the last months. Such a, sur um, <coughs> such a survey, among other issues, led us to investigate how eco museums are interested in SDGs and uh, are eco museums implementing the SDGs. Last part of my presentation is dedicated to the conclusion. Well, Eco Heritage Project is an Erasmus Plus project. It is financed by the European Union. It involves four countries, Portugal, Spain, Poland and Italy. It takes 30 months and it starts on 1st December 2020. The main objective uh, of, uh, of this project is to raise awareness about eco museums as a collaborative heritage management model to provide skills to adult learners with innovative training materials, to generate a communication network between eco-museums at the national and the European level, and to foster the creation of eco-museums as an endogenous resource for competitiveness and social, economical and environmental sustainability. <clears throat> Concerning the output, at least four output are scheduled for this project. The first one is a report based on the result of the survey that we are going to present and it's described the situation of some eco museums belonging to the four countries uh, involved in our project. The second one is a manual for best practice. We are working on, the, on this manual. The third one is a, a toolkit for participatory heritage management. The last one is to build an eco museums online network and the web-based training app. In the surveys were involved 102 eco-museums that come from Italy, Poland, Portugal and Spain, of course. And uh, the survey was based on a questionnaire that is composed of a five sections. The first section is about the museum's identification, structure and management is the second one. The third one was about human relations and partnership. The fourth one was the museum's approach to innovation. The last one was about the museum's performance. In this last session, there were some questions about the role of the SDGs in the activities of the eco-museums. In particular, I'm going to show the result of four main questions. The first question was, indicate which SDGs are included in the activity promoted by your eco-museums. As you can see, the answers were quite different, but we can say that the main SDGs included in eco-museums activity uh, are quality education and gender equality. The second question that I'm going to consider was indicate which are the most urgent SDGs for your eco-museums. And again, the answers were quite different, but we can say that the most urgent SDGs for the eco-museums are again quality education, but also responsible production and the consumption. Well, as you can see from the data, Climate action is not included in the activities uh, of eco-museums and it's happened even though eco-museums are aware of the problem and of the necessity to take care of it. And it's happened even though eco-museums are promoters of sustainability because they foster responsible tourism and uh, they try to protect the natural and the cultural heritage. Looking at the Eco Heritage Survey, definitely just Poland affirms to include climate action in their practices, and Spain indicates climate action as one of their most urgent SDGs. The third question that uh, we consider was Do you integrate SDGs in your strategic policies? And uh, the majority of uh, Italian and the Portuguese eco museums affirm to integrate in their strategic, in the SDGs in their strategic policies. In Spain, half museums integrate them, 
uh, while in Poland only few eco museums integrate SDGs in the, their strategic policies. The last question was, uh, does your eco museums have activity exclusively creating uh, for the SDGs? And the data showed that there is a relevant difficulty to implement activities directly focused on SDGs. So, which are our first conclusions? Eco museums are a vehicle for SDGs because they can be a tool for economic, social, and environmental sustainability. And there is an interest from eco museums in implementing the sustainable development goals and the climate action, but also there is a huge difficulty in doing it. Eco museums are starting to be aware of this difficulty, and what we are trying to understand with the Eco Heritage Project is if a possible strategy for making eco museums more operative in implementing SDGs is launching training programs that can help eco museums in defining the type of knowledge, but also method for building practices focused on sustainable development goals and climate change. In the Eco Heritage Transnational Report, we try to give guidelines for defining the ways for developing a training program. And what was highlighted is that the training models should serve for improving the museum's services and their relation with the communities. And in terms of effectivity and applicability, some specific topics should be addressed in a clear connection between local and global agenda. Such topics are, again, the strategic use of sustainable development goals, the climate action, innovation, but also monitoring and evaluation. In particular, we are planning to have a module, the module six, that will be dedicated to the climate action SDGs. So to sum up, what we can say uh, is that um, uh, trying to give an answer uh, uh, on the question how it consumes can foster SDGs and the role of the training programs, Training can foster the sustainable development goals in eco museums when it raises awareness on sustainable, on sustainable development goals and climate change. When we try to divulgate the discourse on sustainable development goals and climate change, and when it's try to build the practices on SDGs and climate change. I was very, I take very few minutes because uh, I imagine that we don't have too much time. <laughs> so thank you very much for having me and um, I can uh, leave the floor to the next um, speaker. Okay, thank you very much Nuncia and uh, let's see the, the results, uh, um, the next result of uh, uh, Eco Heritage Project. And now it's the turn of uh, Ezio Marra uh, from Milan Bicocca University. He is a professor of environment sociology and uh, he is applied researcher concerning sustainable urban, urban tourism and policy issues in metropolitan areas. So, Thank you, Ezio, and uh, uh, you will have 10 minutes and I will inform you when you left uh, three minutes. Thank okay. you, welcome. I start. Can you understand me? Okay. Yes. My presentation in full screen. Okay. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Okay. First, can democracy save the environment good question uh, roadmap of presentation what is democracy uh, democracy is a method of procedural rules the race of ethno-racial cleavage global versus local urban regimes and coalition of power environment two different approaches footprint and biocapacity democracy and environment uh, AP and uh, Environment Performance Index and the PM 2.5 uh, and Democracy, the Ungovernable Spread of Authoritarian Countries, Conclusions. Democracy, okay. We go fast. 
the classical theory of Aristotle, <coughs> uh, the, there are different, uh, excuse me, always, well, well okay. Uh, democracy is the government of all cities uh, with the advantage of the poor. Tyranny with the advantage of monarch, oligarchy, a government of few with the advantage of the rich. Uh, it's not changing uh, today so, so <clears throat> far. Now I have two different uh, schemas. Uh, the first one is an old uh, framework from Lipseter Ockant. I think this uh, framework uh, worked uh, uh, until uh, uh, the end of 80s. Huh? Uh, but nowadays doesn't work uh, uh, anymore because uh, the class conflict, uh, we, we cannot to think uh, on the <clears throat> class conflict divide uh, for divide uh, left, right, uh, and other kind of this thing. Uh, the new interpretation, recent interpretation, is from Piketty that uh, <clears throat> found five, uh, four uh, different uh, kind uh, of uh, uh, cleavages, new cleavages. Egalitarian nativist, egalitarian internationalist, uh, in egalitarian nativist, in egalitarian internationalist uh, that you can see here. This is a, a framework a scheme uh, until uh, the uh, 2018. Uh, as you can see, uh, there is a rise of nativists until the 2018 and the fall down of internationalists. But I don't know if the story is finished because in Germany we are going on the contrary in the different direction. Uh, there are two slides from Piketty. One is the highly educated persons, as you can see in the year after. Uh, the start of the new century, the uh, highly educated person voted on the left. Hmm? This is a new strange kind of thing because it was not so uh, some um, years before the, uh, the starting of this century. In the last century it was different. Another interesting is the property, the not income, property, wealthy people with uh, uh, financial assets, uh, pro property. As you can see the, in the green uh, line, the 30% of wealthy, uh, highly wealthy uh, people vote for the left. Huh? Another useful framework, but I think I finish with the framework. Uh, the urban regimes, uh, we can uh, uh, find uh, five different uh, uh, urban regimes the city of grow machine, uh, real estate, uh, the 40 city, always manufacturing. Manufacturing has changed because of robot, but uh, is still alive. The polytechnic city, the creative city. The city is an entertainment machine, and I, uh, I hope is growing. The blue green city, the sustainable city, sustainable development, and so on. Environment. We have two different approach uh, on environment. The env env environmental performance index from Yale University. Uh, this is uh, you can see is based on thirty two indicators. Uh, in 11 different uh, categories uh, and the footprint uh, uh, network compared with uh, uh, bio capacity of countries. This is a map of environment, environmental performance index. 
as you can see, the Western democracy don't perform uh, bad, huh? are not so bad. Uh, is bad Africa, is bad uh, the south uh, of Asia, uh, and so on. We can see more, something more. But uh, the ecological deficit, uh, the global footprint network is quite different. Hmm? The no good uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, nations, countries are uh, United States, uh, the Southern Europe, not the Northern Europe, uh, always the South Asia, uh, some part of Africa. Uh, South America is quite uh, good. So why this? two different interpretation of data. Uh, here, the, some uh, uh, European countries, Finland, green, the footprint is less uh, the, than biocapacity. So Norway, so Sweden, so Canada, but France, Germany, Italy, and the USA in Western democracy, the uh, food, ecological footprint is greater than the bio capacity. These are other uh, countries, Argentina, Australia, Brazil. Brazil has a great uh, big uh, bio capacity, Russian Federation, starting of, of course after uh, when Russia, after the, the Soviet Union, China, India, Mexico, Qatar, Qatar is one of the consuming uh, environmental resources consuming. <clears throat> then for uh, try to think, uh, say something about democracy and biocapacity or environmental performance index, I use the democracy index from the Economist Intelligence Unit of the Economist. Here is a map. We have some graphs. Sorry, Ezio, you have uh, two I minutes left. Finish. Democracy index, environment performance. The R square is uh, not so good, but if we, uh, if we, um, if we are looking at the same uh, scatter without uh, authoritarian regime, here the linear R square is more significant so you have a straight line within full democracies flowed democracy hybrid regimes this is another scatter important you can look uh, at uh, this is very important exposure <coughs> exposition to uh, pm2 uh, point 0.5 in different countries. Some countries are over uh, more higher than unhealthy or unhealthy for uh, sensitive group. We, the, the red uh, <clears throat> points, uh, democracies are in general are moderate or good. This is the same. Mm, raising classify mm, with box plot. This is the same PM2 uh, exposition. And conclusions. <clears throat> the different approach, the AP approach and uh, GFN approach. Uh, <clears throat> The first one, the AP approach, shows that most developed and democratic countries are increasing and implementing environment protection policies. The but the GFN index shows that even the most developed and democratic countries continue to pollute the environment, even if today is less than yesterday. The authoritarian countries don't follow a precise model. Some implement virtuous policies while others 
pollute to excess. In general, full flowered, the more in full flowered and full and flowered democracies, green demand counts more. Hybrid regimes are in translation. Authoritarian regimes are out of control. Uh, I hope that the international community will able to steer them in the right direction. We hope that the increase in literacy of the world population will lead to greater environmental and democratic awareness. This is a graphic always from Piketty. We have a great increase in literacy rate, and I hope this is a good opportunity for environment. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Ezio, and uh, um, very for your very interesting presentation and uh, data. Uh, we we can reflect on, on them, and uh, uh, thank you all the speakers uh, uh, from this uh, section. And now it's time for the conclusions. Uh, and the Aneco Museums and Community Museum Coalition after the COP26. And uh, uh, so I leave the floor to uh, Henri McGee again for the conclusions. Let's go back to the Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. So, I mean, it's just, it's fantastic to hear so many um, different presentations um, and really, really, really highlighting the value of this um, framework of, of 17 goals, which I'll, I'll come to talk, talk about. Um, but I thought I'd return again to the, to the, to the, um, to, to, um, to human rights really as a as foundation of what we're talking about. And this is a, a quote from Eleanor Roosevelt that I absolutely love that I'm just gonna, gonna read out because I think it speaks to our, to our work that where after all do universal human rights begin in small places close to home, so close and so small that they cannot be seen on any maps of the world. Yet they are the world of the individual person, the neighborhood that he or she lives in, the school or college that he or she attends, the factory farm or office where he or she works. Such are the places where every man, woman and child seeks equal justice, equal opportunity, equal dignity without discrimination. Unless these rights have meaning there, they have little meaning anywhere. Without concerted citizen action to uphold them close to home, we shall look in vain for progress in the wider world, in the larger world. And this was from, from Eleanor Roosevelt, which she called the great question um, in, in 1958. Because it speaks so much to what we're, we're talking about, whether we think about it from a rights-based perspective or, or not. Um, so this is the latest program that we have, you know, launched in 2015 to run till 2030. And it is ultimately a program about human rights. It's ultimately a program about um, uh, empowerment. And if we can think about the last presentation there, you know, about democracy, um, the sustainable development goals are a, a you know, participatory um, framework, but it's really important to recognize that they don't exist in isolation. They are only the results framework for this um, document on the left-hand side, transforming our world, which recognizes a few problems, that the problems of today are interconnected, that the problems in one place are often created somewhere else, and that we can't just look at dealing with problems one after the other and just pushing them around the planet because it just doesn't work. We need to think about opportunities for all people to participate in sustainable development. And the reason that we should do that is because it's actually their right. You know, we can think about um, the right to self-determination, the right to development. Uh, these are well-established human rights. But as we see in society, we have so few opportunities to, to, to ex experience and, and exercise our rights or even to know what they are. And so I'll give you a, a shorthand version of why we need the Sustainable Development Goals. So these two photographs were taken in the same place just by coincidence. The one on the top is when the United Nations countries agreed to the Kyoto Protocol. It's to do with climate change in 1995. Uh, 1995, yeah. So in the lower image, 
shows the conference in Kyoto, the ICOM tri triennial, where the members adopted um, two resolutions, one on sustainability and the implementation of Agenda 2030, and the other one on community uh, museums and sustainability. Now, I don't just show this to show the, um, the coincidence of it, but to draw attention to the fact that they're, they're more than 20 years apart. And that's why there's, this is a serious problem. We have a breakdown in um, how the agreements are made or you know, the, prob the problems are, are addressed through these agreements, but unfortunately governments are often the weak link in the chain. We need to find a way to, sh to short circuit that to find the opportunities for people to be empowered to play a part in these agendas. So what we've spoken a few times today about the, the think local, um, what is it again? Think global and act, and, act lo and act local, act local and think global. It's actually both. It's actually act lo local to act global. You know, if global is just local everywhere, we can't just think, oh, we'll think about this stuff and we'll see what happens. We need to do it because it won't happen by accident. And so if we can take the shorthand for the um, for Agenda 2030 and the, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, it's actually much easier to remember as these five Ps about people, planet, prosperity, peace and partnership. And this is, we can think about this very easily in a small institution such as a, as a museum or an eco museum or a community museum where, um, where you're not really existing in, within the, the silo that we, we see silos all over the place in institutions, in countries, in governments. The more we think about these five things together, it's not so many to remember and to recognize that any discussion that claims to be about sustainability that doesn't consider all of people, planet and prosperity isn't a discussion about sustainability. We have to consider these things together. And so these are the goals, um, a set of 17 goals, but it's really important to emphasize that they're only the goals that help to better achieve existing agreements. They're not a replacement for human rights, for the Paris Agreement, for the Convention on Biodiversity. They're supposed to be a kind of almost like a puzzle. We try to, to work out this puzzle to address all of those, those better. And it's, it's very common to hear people talk about climate change as if it is only goal 13. And that's very understandable because it's there as goal 13. Climate change affects everything, both in the sense that climate change really will undermine progress for all of the other 16, but also that all of the other 16 can be directed towards addressing climate change. You don't address climate change by addressing climate change, you address it by, by, by dealing with everything else. So if we think about, um, I mean, it's, and I would also point out that it's quite worrying that when, through a few of the presentations today, that we see that poverty and hunger, which are arguably the greatest, wastes of human life, happiness and potential are still so little addressed um, in the museum sector. That's really a, a great shame. And I hope that we can, we can do more, more to address that. And I would also point out that, um, uh, that poverty is not just about access to money and, and, and wealth, although that is of course part of it, it's about access to your natural resources, to your heritage, to opportunity and decision making. So in aiming to be more inclusive, we actually help to address poverty. And so what is needed for a coalition? And what I thought I would do was to think about this in terms of the four parts of Agenda 2030 and transforming our world. People are often familiar with the goals and targets, but or, or the goals, but often less familiar with the other parts. So this is uh, suggested here just as a kind of form of, you could think of it as a form of localization. So um, vision and principles. So we really we will really need to have clear statements of intent, of our commitment to a better world, and but also to acknowledge people's active, free, and meaningful participation in shaping this vision and principles. We can't just have museums deciding what everyone should be doing because that's very against a rights-based approach. 
but our eco museums are really very well placed to work with communities to say, well, what is our vision of the future? What do we want this place to be like? And what difference do we want this place to make to the wider world? The results framework is the easy part because that's the sustainable development goals and targets, certainly, those are the existing results framework. So we can take this and we can adapt it to our local circumstance. What are the goals um, and what do they mean in, in the place where we operate? Um, do the targets work for us? And if they don't, what additional targets do we need? What indicators will be meaningful? Because it has to be said that the official indicators are, are made for the country's reporting. So they're, they're often not so relevant. But really crucially, the means for implementation is how will this happen? Um, in, in goal 17 is the means of implementation, it's partnerships. That we need partnerships within and between sectors and groups. We need effective relationships with communities and with people as individuals, again, as is their right, to create meaningful results and outcomes. But also we can't just make statements and declarations we need to be held to account. We need to make sure that we do this stuff. So we need to gather the information to tell the story of our activity. We need to share and report openly and transparently to hold ourselves and one another and to be held to account to honor our commitments and statements. So we need to move together and we, we need to move fast. And I'd like to say again that um, sustainability as it used to be talked about in its old sense was about trying not to do much, to try to not be harmful, you know, don't, don't harm things. That's just not enough. Sustainable development is about trying to make the world a better place and, and sustainable development is how we do it. So just to point out, there are many great opportunities for um, eco museums, museums, communities of all, of all sorts to connect with. So they, these are about how we can take the global to the local. The decade of ecosystem restoration, ocean science for sustainable development, the last decade of the SDGs, and so on and so on. A fourth international decade to end colonialism, international decade for indigenous languages will start next year. Um, I'd point out we're halfway through this international decade to eradicate poverty, but, um, but there is still uh, six years left for us to do a lot more and this, this international decade for people of African descent. So these are really easy, low hanging fruit, you know, to connect with, because it's not just about how we take um, global agendas and kind of transplant them to our local setting. They're about how we enable people in our local setting to play a part in these if they so wish. And that would seem to me to be a, to be a good thing. So in the sense that museums and eco museums and so on they can reach lots of people they they can reach you know huge numbers of people um but these kind of agendas they help they they help to give um our programs and our activities purpose and i would say that that combination of of reach and purpose is impact and that's to say that it's impact that's decided upon and shaped in a way that's that's owned by the communities, by the people that we, we work with and we, and we touch, rather than a top-down agenda, because that's not what it is at all. And so just to, to say again, like, so where do human rights begin? To go back to Eleanor Roosevelt's fantastic quote, if they are to be, if they could be these small places cl close to home, why can't they be eco museums and museums? So the challenges are huge, People want to do things, many people want to do things, but they just lack the opportunity to do so. So it would seem to me to be really obvious that um, we just put these things together. There's so much to so much to, to gain from it. It gives us purpose and it will give eco museums and museums a future as well. So that's how I would like to end. So thank you. Thank you very much, Henry. Now, do. Thank you so much, Henry, for your speech. I sincerely think that it's, it is really important. As you know, this event aims to strengthen the collaboration between uh, museums uh, and the culture, in university and the cultural institution 
So with this event, uh, um, we try to make a step forward uh, for reaching our hope, our dream, uh, that is uh, to be able to continue to work to, uh, together with the passion and the tenacity for a sustainable uh, local and global development. So I think that what we can try to do in the future is to find a way for making the collaboration among these different institutions more effective. We have to find a way to make the collaboration not only a formal things, but some things that give a real effect. This is the point. And what we need to do now is to start talking more and to understand in which way the collaboration can become a real collaboration. Because the eco museums and museums already do many things, but the, they, in many cases, they are not together. They don't work together. They don't collaborate enough. And people outside the world of eco museums and of community museums is not able to understand the potential of this institution. So we we, we have to make the efforts to work together for. Of course, uh, sharing information, collaborating, but also for let people that is outside our world understand what uh, this uh, institution are able to do. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Harry, for your conclusion. Thank you very much to everybody. This is time for asking if there are some questions. Are there any questions before closing the event? You can see if. I've got a, I've got a, an invitation, but I think there is Douglas Douglas uh, uh, question or not? I don't know. Douglas words. Hmm. Douglas, do you have a question? Gelson, do you have a question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, gracias, Lucy. Uh, considering um, I... the words. Okay, Sorry, I did. Was... I did put one in the in the chat. Actually, I've put two in the chat. Um, so, if you want to turn to those, then that's fine. I'm happy to discuss them. Uh, I I I think in the last words for on the question. Uh, last okay. words. Yes, maybe we can we can let uh, Gelson have the possibility to finish what he was saying, and then we can read the questions. Douglas, is a problem for you because he started talking. Yeah, no, that's fine. Okay, thank you very much. Please, Gelson. Oh, gracias. Oh, thank. Well, well, considering the words spoken here about the sustainability, democracy, and economy. It's very important to remember that actions and community, eco museums, museums, community, uh, can make a difference with communities and local authorities can contribute to an awareness to of gravity of climate change, uh, like ECON, like IPCC. We can do better if we organize ourselves in networks and partnerships, but is in it is important to remember that the destruction of, of nature and the brutal exploitation of human beings was carried out by capitalism, which continues with the most violent forms in most parts of the world. As Greta Thunberg said yesterday, uh, and now blah, blah, blah. We need more action. The planet's life depends on this transformation. Here, uh, what do you think is more action for transformation the planet in the next 10 years? That question to me, Gelson. Yes. Yeah, can you just repeat the last bit? What what does the small yeah, action? Think. Just repeat the last bit. What what small action is needed? Sorry, uh, don't... Just repeat the last part of your question for me. Oh. Look up a bit. Uh, the planet's life depends on transformation. What the action you think uh, the plants and the humans net need in the next 10 years? Yeah, so I think the um, you talk you talk a bit there about the inequality between the, the north, basically the global north and the global south. 
and the great danger is that the rich global north countries will try to just adapt their ways ways out of climate impacts rather than you know acknowledging they need they need to reduce their emissions but of course that inequality might have been established over the last you know 200 years but it's maintained by decisions today so the more that we can the the including museums um including all of us can understand well, what, what are our lives actually financing? Where is my pension pot? What is it? What are people spending my pension money on? Or my, um, you know, the, how is the interest in my bank account earned? So I think we have to all have a bit of an interest in this, but also the most, arguably the most important people thing that people can do is to write to their MPs, to their politicians. Um, like we see so much disengagement from pol from politics in the global north that, it, you know, we, we just need to do this stuff. We need to um, show a greater interest in the wider world beyond just the, the borders of our own lives. And um, that, that's what I think is the, um, the big um, challenge, but is also becomes increasingly difficult as it becomes harder and harder to work out what impact you have, like, so who, so my phone, who made my phone, who made my clothes, you know, who was, exp you know, if it's, if it was cheap for me, it wasn't cheap for someone else. And so, you know, what's cheap for me is based on exploitation of someone else. And it's just to have an aware, a greater awareness of these things is really important, I think. Thank you, Gelsom, and thank you, Ali, for your answer. We can return to Douglas, yes. Uh, well, I, I put a couple of, of questions in. One about um, uh, tourism, and uh, because I, I do think that tourism is is very, um, well, what, what I should say is that I think that building relationships around the world so that people have the kind of understanding of how, as Henry was talking about, we have a globalized um, uh, source of all kinds of goods, but we don't know how they're made. We don't know how it impacts other lives, and uh, and we just get them. And the only the only framework we have for judging these things really is a monetary one. How much does it cost? And uh, and we don't even really care about the. Um, um, what the the waste products are, the unintended consequences of all that. So tourism, I think, offers a way to build connection and uh, relationship, but it's it's problematic in a lot of ways. At at this point, there's a lot of uh, carbon intensity, and it's only available to the rich. Um, so. You know, how can we um, develop a uh, an approach to our operations as museums um, that build that cohesion um, in a functional way that that helps to transform how the system works? Because the uh, ultimately sustainability is not about individual components of a, of a lot of things. Um, it's about how they all come together to create one big system. And that's what's unsustainable and that's what's collapsing. Um, and we're just seeing it manifested in certain ways, but there, you, know, you often don't know what your act, actions lead to in terms of um, um, impacts in other parts of the system. And uh, I, I'm still not sure how to deal with that, but I think the eco museums have this great foundation of being connected to local community and building and aspiring to well-being and and I, I think justice um, in a way that we don't have in the larger um, cultural frames and, and larger museums that see themselves mostly as tourist destinations because we don't have a theory of change for museums about how we're what we're doing is actually going to create the change that will uh, change the trends um, that make up our unsustainable world. Anyway, I'll stop with that. Yeah, so if I can, can uh, just respond to that, that um, I mean, one of the great um, uh, pedagogies, learning approaches is education for state sustainable development. Uh, and I can't remember the full definition of it off the top of my, my head, but it says, well, it makes its difference in the world. That's how it's, de it's defined by the difference it makes in the world. Because so often, certainly in museums, 
they're they're not that even they're they're very unconfident about the difference that they make in the world or even that they aim to make in the world so and if we can think about um uh, let's talk about um unsus the unsustainable consumption and production of museums so in a large museum they may spend a huge amount of money to develop an exhibition to attract a lot of tourists or, or other people who may typically be high consumers and it produces a lot of waste in the process. It's, it's like the opposite of a sustainable model. So approaches that really are focused on helping people to understand impacts and that are really about really small things. You know, we, we've seen so many times today, the lovely little small butterfly to appreciate the small, beautiful butterfly does not, does not cost a huge amount of money. It just needs a little bit of time and opportunity to see the butterfly. Mm -hmm. And I think like if we can talk about this um, with um, the relationship between tourism and, and heritage, because like, if, let's take the world heritage list it inadvertently creates a kind of bucket list that drives really unsustainable tourism that people travel around the world seeing world heritage sites. It's not, I think, how it was intended to be used. Um, but if we talk about this like responsible tourism, sustainable tourism has kind of two ends to it. Well, it has three parts to it really about how you educate and empower people before they become tourists. So before they've gone anywhere. So arguably the way that um, an eco museum works with communities and visitors before they've traveled a really long distance is, is, one, end of, is one end of it. And the other end of course is, well, well you know, who is doing all this traveling? Are, is, it, is it just really high consumers? And we need to kind of turn it round a bit so that um, in relation to the discussion, the presentation before about democracy, we, so that we no longer think about the rich northern countries as if they're the great countries and the global south countries are the problem countries. It's the other way around. Mm -hmm. And that we flip it so that high consumption is just socially unacceptable. But if and that comes to about, you know, what, what museums and cultural institutions do, like what social norms do they help support and create? So if they are aiming to be, you know, aim just for tourists, big expensive things that have massive consumption, that, that, that kind of has to change. So looking for the museum models, such as eco museums that aren't that model, the big museums can learn from them, not the other way around. Right. Very much, Harry and Douglas. Are there any suggestions, comments, or questions? I, I, got, I got an invitation. Um, yeah. Yes, please. Um, well, uh, very interesting what has been said. And uh, the speakers just uh, um, insisted on many key words, many, many. We have to elaborate them. And I, I think that uh, Rosentino, uh, Rosentino's question was very hard to be answered. But he was very concrete. He asked, what could we do in 10 years time? And my dear, I would say to Rosentino, it's a big job. But anyway, we have to um, increase uh, Eco Museum strength uh, through the help of the community. Because we have to, uh, to be educated together with the community how to recognize, to be aware of what uh, we have and where we live and what is surrounding us. So my invitation, just to be very sure because time is over, is why don't you think we could elaborate the contents, what we said, and make a sort of 10 points recommendation to send to Scotland, to the meeting in Scotland, just to say the AQ Museums and uh, reunited in this conference with the help of other ones could be just, uh, could uh, send a message in a form of recommendations I did with other project and a sort of manifesto uh, which takes care to say 
all what we examine today, because we hadn't the time to reason, we only announce, but I think it's very important to have a resolution because between saying and between making, there is the concreteness of the action. We, we miss action, very uh, effective action. So I think it, it could be a good opportunity and chance to, to reason all together uh, in tranquility, through email and so on, to make a sort of uh, manifesto to send to Scotland, to the meeting in Scotland. And it's an invitation. Yeah, can I respond to that? That um, that I think like your Echo Museum network, that the people you need to get the message to are the Echo Museums. And I would suggest you already have your manifesto in the resolution from ICOM from 2019. So I think the next bit, it's like, okay, so what's next? What are the actions? And so, thinking about like um, when we come to COP27, which will probably be in Egypt uh, next, next year, is to be thinking now, well, when it comes to COP27, what are you going to say that you've done? You know, so you can use the COPs as a catalyst and to do it that way. I think because there are so many declarations of, you know, we, we are this and we, we're that. It's like, we need to, we need to see action. And it's like, I think that's the bit, it's like, so what are the actions? Because, I mean, as I mentioned, um, they, the importance of museums got into the work programme for the Paris Agreement before museums had even adopted the SDGs. So the, the sector, you know, the, the um, internet, you know, the UN climate change and so on, they totally get the, the importance of public engagement and so on. That's an open door. We don't need to persuade them of that. What we need to do is to build the action within the within the sector is to and it's not to say um if we contribute to this sdgs or how we contribute to the sdgs it's like how are we contributing and to use the sdgs as a way to tell the story and that's that's what i think is the next bit but it's to build the confidence within the sector to build the sustainability literacy of what sustainable development is um, and and to do it that way, um, so I th yeah I think that's my it's because as as I say it's um, COP twenty six is a political event. Um, the bit of the Paris Agreement that's about public engagement and participation that's already agreed that was agreed in twenty eighteen. The bits the governments will be working on are the carbon trading mechanism, so you know, that, that bit is already agreed. The governments have already agreed that bit. There will be a new programme for, for this thing called Action for Climate Empowerment. But that would be my suggestion is to like really think within your network, within between yourselves, what is it we're going to do in the next 12 months? What are you going to commit to do and do in the next 12 months so that you've got a great story to tell in November next year? Thank you again, Harry. Maybe Glenn, do you want to say something? Do you have a question? Yes, thank you. I just wanted, as a, the conversation has been going on, it, I'm thinking that um, there's a strong focus on <clears throat> a number of things, a number of activities that are obviously happening in the public sphere. Museums, of course, are in the public sphere, and most democratic governments try to be a little bit in the public sphere. But there's a third very powerful group out there in the private sector, the corporate interests that is operating globally, has an incredible social and economic power. Um, and I think it needs to be part of the discussion uh, for a couple of reasons. One, they do have a lot of power and can influence when brought on, brought into the discussions effectively. Um, but at the same time, um, part of the, since their motivation is slightly, is largely profit, um, there have been plenty of examples around my part of the world where they have a strong influence on the public awareness that we're talking about. And, you know, they will, they will offer training programs to teachers to make sure that's a more of a balanced message being put out there around coal production because their stakeholders want more coal production. Um, and ultimately by 
by offering more of a balanced approach as opposed to leaving fossil fuels in the ground, saying we need to have a more balanced approach and we need to make sure individual responsibility is emphasized, that puts the, re that puts the blame on the consumer, the, largely the blame. And I think that's, um, that's short-sighted. It's very, it means people are not likely to be empowered um, and actually, it's it's not it's not valid because, as I've mentioned, the corporate sector has these large, very powerful interests, and they, they control the message, in many many ways. So, I just want to make sure that that entire uh, part of the sustainability challenge is not overlooked in what eco museums would want to do. I think there's plenty of partnerships that could be fostered, and some really provocative uh, engagement activism that could be undertaken. So I just wanted to make that point. Thank you very much, Glenn. There is someone that wanted to make a comment. Raul. Okay. Are there any other comments, Edo? Yes, but I got a lot of commentary uh, that there is no time to reason upon that because of what uh, Henry just said is very correct. But he should think that uh, the situations in other countries are not so beautiful probably as it, they are in Scotland. Because uh, in, in Italy, Monti Aral make a compare, we had to fight for the existence of eco museums, because community just uh, um, have eco museums, but institutions are now going to accept and to consider it at the same level with the museums. I work with museums. I'm from ICOM as well. I've got a lot of difficulty to say that museums should go outside, but in a real concrete way not only announcing, you know, words, but also I think that when Harry says, well, we need actions, hey, that's correct. It's a long time we're trying uh, to, we are trying to make actions. But I, I must, con I, I should conclude uh, saying this, because the, the most critical point is people's awareness. We should educate people, not only scholar uh, pupils, but only adults to understand where they live. Because if they understand where they live, probably they will, won't consume in a so wasteful way. It's a sort of a process, mental process. If we love the place where, where we live, we take care of it. But if we don't love it, we won't care. And I think that um, a lot of people uh, belonging to museums um, realize what there was around them only when they were in a museum because they, they spend their life, their life without taking notice of what they have. So I think, I think education is very important, totally speaking, generally speaking. Education, not, that means not only to school, to pupils, to kids, because it's very simple to speak to pupils. It's very hard to speak to adults. Because institutions, I, I, I could spend more time saying, institutions a reason with a political point of view. So we need actions, but we need to carry on a campaign of education as well. That's why I said it's very important from this meeting to have a sort of a resolution because otherwise we only met saying our opinion. But I think we have to act politically speaking with an action, a resolution. I, uh, can, I, you yeah, can, I, can, I, can I just, just re respond to that? Yeah. Uh, um, so when there was the Decade for Education for Sustainable Development, 2005 to 14, hardly anyone did anything. So we now have this new ESD 2030, which already exists as a fantastic opportunity. Um, next May, I think it is, will be the new, the, the COP, but for the Convention for Biodiversity. 
So as I say, there's like there, there, it's so easy to make agreements, but what is the action? I know. Between saying and making, obviously. I know, <laughs> I know very well, Harry. It's, I spent my life uh, just struggling for this. <laughs> All my life, I've got uh, your white uh, hair. But then I think that's where you can, like, like thinking about using the goal, the SDGs and targets, not as kind of if we connect with it or do we connect with it. It's like, okay, how are we going to do better? How can we use them to help, to help grease the wheels, to help set the agenda, to plan the activity, to monitor and evaluate and to communicate it? I mean, you have such a, like in Italy, you have such a great opportunity with these, you know, you have your network, as I understand it, the SDGs are quite prominent in the country. You know, these are, it should be, you know, ways to put these things together. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I totally agree, Harry. <laughs> but now future is something we have to design. No, no, I agree, I agree, completely, totally agree. Okay. okay, thank you so much to everybody for your presentation. I have just a few comments for the end, for closing the conference. I think that what we need to, to work um, is that we need absolutely to work on education and on activism and education and activism not only for puppets, but for adults. And uh, when we talk about adults, we have not to only think about the consumers, but also the enterprises, because both subjects need to be involved. And all subjects, all actors need to be uh, make aware of the effect of their actions. So for closing, we can say that again, we need to reduce the gap among discourse and practices. It is not easy. Of course, it is not easy, but this is what we can try to do. This is, a, or even though we will be able to do very few step forwards, it will be a result. So we just go on and try to do something good. So before closing, closing the event, I would like to thank you again, everyone. I remind you that the event is recorded, recorded and that the proceeding will be soon available on the International Drops platform. Correct, Raul? And uh, moreover, I would like to remember you that a scientific publication edited by Peter Davis, um, uh, me and Raul Del Santo, will, will spread the result of this meeting. This publication is a financing uh, by a grant that we are obtaining uh, after a submission, after an application, and the publication will be an open access. So it's very important that you send your contribution because this, it will be a way for divulgate the result of uh, uh, this, uh, this event and also to make people um, easy, and also to make it easy available. Okay. Thank you very much again to everybody. See you very soon. Bye. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for all. Bye. Bye. Bye bye. See you.